in the meantime, we uh, we were talking about um, we were talking about oh yeah, how people cannot refute the whole flat Earth thing or the whole flat yeah. Earth theory, and yeah. how people have not been able to come back at you. Um, wasn't there a point at which uh, you or somebody had offered some sort of prize, a cash prize, if they could if they could book a flight nonstop from um, South America to Australia? Uh, not me, because I learned fairly quickly when I was doing the clues. You know, when I did clue seven, I talked about the plane flights and how they were. It was really frustrating because in the southern hemisphere, you can't 95, at least 95 percent of the flights in the southern hemisphere are non are um are not nonstops. They're double connections or triple connections, and they're ridiculous. You know, they'll a flight that should take 12 hours across an ocean from Africa to South America <laughs> takes 45 hours. In some case, and you're bouncing off multiple cities in the northern hemisphere. Or my favorites were the ones, if you were trying to go from Brazil, so uh, like Rio, going from Rio to Australia, you're going through Los Angeles and Dallas and Seattle. And it's like, what are you doing? You know, are you are you actually trying to pick up people? What what exactly is happening here? And. It was amazing to to see. So, but no, I didn't offer that because there was at least one listed flight. Now, whether you could get it or not, I'm not sure. Uh, the one that I, that kept coming at me literally was and people kept sending me emails was Qantas Flight 64, and which showed I think it was Santiago, Chile to Sydney. I think that was the one. Okay, and. Yeah. And because of that, that's when I looked into it, and that's when I found, again, just by happenstance, that the GPS system was falling off entirely to where when your plane got over water, you know, even 150, 200 miles, which is basically the extent of ground radar range, the old Loran system, uh, your plane disappears off off radar. Now, it'll still show up as a graphic, but you look at the long, longitude and latitude, it'll change from, you know, actual numbers to – approximated or estimated mode and that plane will stay basically unknown location until it gets about an hour to its destination you know and basically till it arrives to a coastline and then it'll pop back up on screen miraculously and that's where you go no i know i did not offer any prizes i would be surprised if somebody actually did but at the time you know i still challenge people to you know to get on one of those flights and spend the time, uh, you know, and, and tell me why. That was the part that bugged me when I was when I was when I was early when I was doing this in the in the first couple months, which was it didn't bother people. You know, people weren't scratching their heads, going, "Huh, that is awfully odd that every flight in the in the southern hemisphere is is uh, double connections and triple connections, and most of them go above the equator to places that you know. Why in the world are when you're going from South America to Africa? Why are you going to the Middle East first? You know what? You know you're. I mean, we're talking South Africa to South South America. Why are you taking these massive jogs and you're doubling your flight time? The the flight people that I was talking to, they all said the same thing. And they said, look, it's all about pounds of fuel, and uh, that you know it's it's all about money. You know the the you know, when you say, oh, we're just picking up people. That's a bunch of crap. I don't care who you're picking <laughs> up. You're you're not you're right. not spending that much time the other people on the plane wouldn't appreciate it everyone would try to go for a non-stop i even had a um a travel agent an international travel agent from the southern hemisphere who said that she got complaints on a regular basis that she could you know it was like why can't we get any freaking non-stops because it was almost impossible to get you can do this right now i mean you can look up any book a flight try to book a flight from anywhere in south america to anywhere in Africa or any any southern to southern hemisphere flights and tell me how many nonstops you find. You you it will be almost impossible. Most of them will be uh, double connections. It's like look, it doesn't take fifty hours to get anywhere. That's right. you're 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 passing two days. You're working on your third day. That doesn't. It's not even possible. You know, we we all know that like if you fly from the states to like Australia, it'll take oh, twenty hours. Roughly, you know, and that's one of the longest flights you can take. That is not true. I mean, yeah, one of the longest nonstop flights you can take. But uh, uh, anyway, it's it's ridiculous. So, <laughs> um, um, before we get ahead of ourselves here, because uh, anybody who's listening to this podcast right now, we've had a technical difficulty. So the first half where we had the introductions and all that stuff um, got cut out. 
uh, I'm working on salvaging that and I, I believe it should be fine. Um, sure. But if you're just coming to this, um, this is Mark Sargent. Um, he uh, is the, he's a big, uh, uh, I forget, I, I don't know exactly how to explain it, but a big proponent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Call it what you will, man. I am the tip of the spear right now when it comes to Flat Earth. Flat Earth uh, Clues, which is on YouTube. Um, any, yep. of, any of you guys can check it out. It's under YouTube, or it's on YouTube under Flat Earth Clues. I've been through all of them except for number 13. Uh, and that one's on your website, uh, Mark. That one's on the website, and uh, yeah, yeah, that one's part of the subscription thing. And again, all the stuff that I've been doing outside of the Flat Earth Clues. When I built the Flat Earth Clues, and I, I don't. When, when did you start getting into this? I got into it probably about a year ago. Okay. Uh, when I first got into Flat Earth Clues, I honestly, if you you listen to my stuff, I honestly did not think that it was going to be. It was going to go as far as as it has because. I thought I made a mistake, you know, like with any calculations, it's like, okay. It, it kind of reminded me of uh, tests I used to take in college where I thought I aced it, but you weren't completely – you were something in the back of your head going, oh, man. I, I don't know. I missed something. <laughs> I know I did. And when I put the the videos out there, I was thinking, okay, there's, I, I missed something. There's got to be – some scientist is going to write me and say, oh, well, you forgot to carry the two here, and therefore everything that you worked on is utter crap. Therefore, you can take the, down your YouTube channel. <laughs> right. Thought it was, was going to happen, and instead the opposite happened. Not only did I not get people yelling at me, but I got immediately got uh, people, you know, podcasters and stuff. I mean, the, the Coast to Coast interview – uh, yeah, I problem. saw you were on that. I was actually, I wasn't surprised, but it was like, wow, I, this guy's on coast to coast. I, I got on in, in three months, and uh, I got on without, in fact, the, the phone call from the producer of Coast to Coast was one of the most surreal things ever, because she was she was asking me, it's like, okay, what's what's the pitch? What are you, what are you, doing? you know, what are you doing? I'm going, Flat Earth? She goes, yeah, 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 I heard it on Ground Zero. Okay, that's good. So what? Um, what's the name of your book? I'm going, book? Uh, and she goes, she goes, okay, a DVD. I go, no. She goes, you got a website, don't you? And I go, um, look, I've only been doing this three months, and I don't really have anything. And you could tell how frustrated she was because, it, and she goes, she goes, why am I talking to you? I go, I go, I don't know. You called me. <laughs> I, I go, I didn't call you. And she, um, and she goes, you know what? And she goes, okay, give me the freaking five minute pitch. And I gave her the five minute pitch, and she goes, all right, you're on. You know, we're going to do it next next week, blah, blah, blah. So I get on, and but before I did, I you know, I, I, start, I signed up for like a, a crash course in web design because I was like, man, I got to get a freaking website up like fast. And it went well, but at the same time, it was a, it was a, kick, in, a kick in the pants for me to get moving because I knew it was like, okay, if these guys start looking at this, then apparently I'm going to keep getting calls. And... It was, you know, to this day. I mean, you know, the the book people called, and and I, I I remember talking to somebody, and they they asked me, it's like, well, how many how many publishers did you submit your 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 stuff to for for the book? I'm going submit. What are you talking about? <laughs> they Wait. called me. They said, hey, we like to turn your flat Earth clues into a book. I go, okay, what do I have to do? They go, just send us your transcripts from your flat Earth clues, and we'll take care of the rest. I, I didn't think much of it. Next thing you know, uh, this outfit in London produces a book. Uh, same thing with the the marksargent.com and the and the the apps. I've got apps. I don't I don't even use a smartphone, and oh. I've got I've got apps. I feel bad because I don't actually have them on my own phone. You know, I was looking at some photos of you actually uh, to uh, post on our website so we could kind of um, you know say hey, just so you know, because I I mean if I'm inviting you on, I want to be able to uh, I want to be able to um, you know let people know what your books are and all that stuff. And I was looking. And I was like, holy cow, his voice does not match his face at all. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a, yeah. In fact, I, I got crap on uh, Canary Cry Radio because they asked me how old I am. And, and at the time, I think I was 47. Now I'm 48. And they go, dude, you sound like you're freaking 20. So I was going, I don't really know how to respond to that. Are you saying I'm old? <laughs> uh, well, no, no. I mean, no, I'm older. No, no question. I'm, I'm definitely middle aged, but. Uh, and I didn't really, again, never thought for a second I would be doing my, my own pod. But yeah, I also, you know, got my own podcast show on, uh, Truth Frequency Radio, which just, by the way, just so happened to got, to get on the, uh, fake news list 
the one that's uh, Zuckerberg from Facebook. Facebook, yeah. Yeah, he, he, you know, but but of course, you know, that thing got retracted almost immediately because he was dumb enough to put Infowars on there, you know, with Alex Jones uh, and, and also other sites like The Onion. It's like, well, of course, The Onion's going to be on there. It's not real news. Nope. It's parody news. But going at you know putting Infowars on there, you're just helping them and and True Frequency. They were happy to happy to be put on the list. So there's yeah. a. Um, what, when we, before we get into the clues, I just wanted to ask you a couple of basic questions and, uh, some questions that I think some people would ask just in here in your flat, flat earth theory, which anybody listening to this, I honestly would encourage you to go check out flat earth clues on YouTube. It's really good stuff. It's pretty solid. And, uh, and just like, let it, let it, you know, poke your brain, let it, let it get you thinking. And that's what I love about um, uh, Mark, that's what I love about the whole uh, flat Earth clues theory is it makes you think. I mean, and I and I'm not beyond that. I'm not beyond considering somebody else's point of view or just questioning the normal. And that's what I loved about flat Earth clues was that mm-hmm. it made you question things that you take for granted every day. Yeah. And uh, that's what I loved about it. So um, just uh, going back a little bit, um, just to get so that the the listeners on this uh, podcast w- can get to know you a little bit more. Um, and uh, things that I think people would ask themselves or mm-hmm. ask themselves uh, and listen to your flat earth clues. But what exactly was your childhood like when you were growing up? Just real quick synopsis. Was it average or, <laughs> you know, let's no, get inside good, the mind of flat. Let's get inside the mind of Mark Sargent here for a second. Uh, I, you know, I should probably recite that line from Dr. Evil, you know, <laughs> where he was doing this like, what about your child? Oh, pretty standard, really. Luge <laughs> lessons. In the summers, we made meat helmets, you know, and that sort of <laughs> shit. Uh, I should, probably, but I'm not going to, because that was not my childhood. Uh, although it was different from most people, I grew up on a fairly rural island in the northwest of the United States, north of Seattle, called Whidbey, W-H-I-D-B-E-Y. I lived on the south end. You had to take a ferry to get to places, and I was. Uh, born in Seattle, but I, I spent all my child, you know, my uh, the entire school system through uh, high school on the south end of the island, and uh, it was really peaceful, and I was super naive, and I think that really helps. I was very innocent. I was just this dumb blonde kid who uh, believed the world as it was presented to us, and didn't even think for a second that conspiracies existed literally believed anything the news told you anything authority told you until i got to college and actually even college i wasn't even that bad but right afterwards right after college i watched the original jfk movie from oliver stone and the and with in a packed house on opening weekend and i realized that i was not the only person in the theater that was believing this that there, there was you know it wasn't just a single gunman with a magic bullet that and you know all that ridiculousness and i was going wait a minute people lie there you know I, it's a, there is such a thing as a conspiracy um of course before that uh i you know you probably you know, have heard me say other things yes i was um uh i'm i I got into my a little bit of trouble during college. You know, I I, I started my own illegal fireworks company, literally on campus, <laughs> and was yes. nailed by the a, the ATF <laughs> my junior year. And, uh, <laughs> and I I'm still wear it like a badge of honor. It's like, look, if you're not getting in trouble in college, you're not trying hard enough. It's just that simple. Everybody makes questionable decisions in college. And I absolutely, that was one of the greatest. I'm, I wouldn't trade it in. People would you do it again? Absolutely, I would do it again. It was fun. I, you know, we had 30 something employees and, and, uh, had a lot of, I mean, everything was on campus. I was up at Western Washington University, um, in Bellingham, Washington, which is just south of the Canadian border. And it was a lot of fun. But anyway, so yeah, childhood basically, you know, rural island, nothing super special. Uh, and then, you know, got into trouble in college. And because of that, uh, one of the things I did, and this was just one of those fun little things, uh, I, for part of my community service, again, going into my criminal record here, part of, part of my community <laughs> service was I taught computers to kids because, uh, there were a lot of teachers in my family. And I, since I grew up, my mom was a career teacher, uh, I grew up in a teacher's lounge. The, that, if you don't, you know, for community service, you don't have to work necessarily on road crews. If you, it depends on who you know. 
you can work as a teacher's aide in in a school if of course they allow you to be next to kids and of course (laughs) everybody in this school district knew me it's like oh yeah mark he's harmless it's not like you know he was chopping up people with hedge trimmers or something so i taught kids computers and during that i uh this is the infancy of cool uh the internet Uh, i was playing uh computer pinball games and entered and a year-long tournament for this computer game that was created in um, Japan, but it was sold through an outfit in Boulder, Colorado. And you probably see where this is going. And I won that tournament in 94. And part of my prize was to review some of their games. And I ended up going to... Uh, they liked my reviews so much that I started on kind of like, not necessarily an intern, but like a junior tech support guy at this company in Boulder, Colorado. And ended up playing video games for a living for three years. You know, went around to, to Macworld Boston and Macworld uh, San Francisco and E3 and, and made games better than they were. Or at least appeared better than they were. I was really good at marketing games. And... Then during that time, you know, I'm out in Boulder. I didn't know anybody in Colorado. Uh, you know, none of my family is out there. Uh, I think I knew one girl that graduated from my high school. Actually, was north of me in Fort Collins. But we hardly ever saw each other. And that's when I kind of got into – that's when I was really digging into the conspiracies. And so, yeah, for the last 20 years, I was doing conspiracies and computer tech support stuff in Colorado and then got super bored with the conspiracy part. And flowers just fell in my lap. It it just woke I I I, you know, I was nudged into I imagine that's the follow up question, which was that I looked I was looking through conspiracies and saw this stupid thing on uh, on flat Earth and this video on YouTube I was going you know what this is silly but I'll click on it why not and I remember feeling physically embarrassed clicking on it you know I actually got <laughs> flushed. I was going, that's weird, because I've clicked on way worse stuff than this on the Internet. Right. And yet here I'm getting embarrassed about this stupid thing. And I started digging into it, and I wouldn't let it go. I am not the fastest problem solver in the world, but I am very thorough and very clever. Ask me about how I won the video game tournament sometime. And I... I dug into it for like nine months and every string that I pulled on led to something else. And for those of people that are out there, know what I'm talking about. It's like, look, when you try to disprove, basically, if you try to prove the globe, you're going to run into a lot of problems. You're going to assume a lot of things, but when you start digging into it, you won't be able, you don't have any solid footing to stand on. And that's what happened. I just kept digging into it more and more. And then after nine months, uh, February of last year, I gave up. I had this weird Jerry Maguire moment in the middle of the night, February 10th, where I woke up and I said, you know what? I think I've got this whole thing laid out. I think I can actually present a case for the flat earth. And I sat down and I just started typing. And I said, okay, I'm going to do this one at a time so I just don't waste everybody's time. And I, I made the intro, the, the, the 16, 17 minute intro, and just you know typed the, all the text. I figured, well, I got to better narrate it, so I got a microphone and you know, cheap piece of crap. I think it was a gaming mic, as a matter of fact, and <laughs> uh, recorded that and said, it's "Never used, never has done a like a like a slideshow before." Open, you know, got Windows Live Movie Maker, which was free. You know, just put it all together, slapped it together. It took me, you know, pretty much all day to do it and put it up on the internet, and that's where we are now. So, sorry, that's the long roundabout thing to what was my childhood like. No, uh, that's all right, but I think Chuck's got a question here for you. What do you got, Chuck? Oh, um, this is uh, just something that we can put down, but I um, just wanted to check with you to see if you had any religious background. You were Oh, yeah. In, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Nation. Uh, I was raised, again, being on a rural uh, island up in the northwest, I was raised born-again Christian. Uh, you know, strong, you know, went to Camp Malibu, again, up in Canada, lots of Canada references, uh, went to vacation Bible school, you know, Sunday school, youth group, Sunday service, the whole nine yards. And that's where, you know, again, because I was blonde, dumb, and, and young, uh, I, you know, took everything at face value. And then, of course, you know, like a lot of people, when you go to college, you experience a lot of different things. It's like, wait, there's other religions? Yeah, you know, there's other things to look at. There's more than one political party. Not everybody votes Republican. And 
then then I kind of fell away from from the church for a while. Now I still had my ideas about God, and as I got more intelligent, I started developing more advanced theories on where we were and possible realities and possible outcomes and you know not just what where we are but why we are here and then and I'd fallen away you know for, I drifted further and further away even though I was coming up with some some great theories and then finally when I dug into flat earth that snapped me back because then it, then it wasn't just about a silly, you know, theory that I may have come back with years ago. It was everybody. It's like, okay, this has religious implications for everybody, and not only that, but it, it. I'm not, I'm not gonna say it unifies the the five major religions, which are um, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. But every one of those groups seems to have pieces of the same puzzle when it comes to this, when it comes to flat earth, because they all agreed at one point, they were all on the same page at one point, And then 500 years ago, science changed that. So yeah, yeah. Christianity was, was the big, so when I quote stuff, I will most of the time quote uh chapter and verse from Christianity. It won't be like Rob Skiba where I, I have tons of stuff memorized, but I do, I've learned, I have actually, here's the funny thing. I have learned more chapter and verse in the last two years than I have in the previous 20. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and it's like that, uh, and, and I don't want to get at it right now, but like, for example, you're, uh, I forget which Flat Earth clue it is, but you have the Tower of Babel story essentially on there. You've got like a modernized, hiding, updated hiding version. God. Hiding God, number 10. I thought that was actually a really creative way to go about that story. I was I was like, wait, is this real? Oh, wait, this is the Tower of Babel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, and I, I, you're right. I did that deliberately. Well, I did that two, twofold. One, I did not want to single out uh, a specific religion when telling that story because I didn't want to say, oh, well, you know, he's obviously, you know, waving the Christian flag. No, no offense. Look, that's how I was raised. But I, I want to be fair because, you know, they only make up, you know, one of the major five religions. But the other thing was, it was if you take out if you take out the chapter and verse out of the Tower of Babel story, it and then apply it to flat Earth or enclosed world, it makes so much sense. It still does. It's one of my favorite things when when people you know, uh, outside of Rob Skiba's testingtheglobe.com, where he doesn't go into it too much, but I really you know I think it's the, the one of the most telling of the stories, which is the Tower of Babel only makes sense if the world isn't moving. Because if you're trying to build a big structure that's going to heaven and the earth is spinning on its axis and spinning around the sun, rotating around the sun, where exactly is that tower going? It's going nowhere. You know, it's, it's moving around. It's in a whole bunch of different spots. And I'll, I'll take one, I'll take a secular thing too, which was a guy from Canary Cry Radio. He was the only guy to suggest this to me, which I think was brilliant. Where she goes, he goes, you, do you realize how much easier an enclo a flat enclosed world makes it for time travel equations because in time travel it's not just about time it's about location you know you've you, you got to worry about time sure but you also got to worry about where the earth is you know if you're trying to go back and forward in time but if it's stationary oh that takes a huge chunk of the work out, out of the out of time travel so anybody that's building their own time travel machines keep that in mind um <clears throat> so um, going back to your family, and I, I'm assuming that your your parents are, are religious parents um, to this current day. I'm assuming, correct? Yes, uh, my father and I haven't spoken in some time, but he, at the time before you know there was a falling out, yes, he he was religious. Uh, my mom, super dedicated uh, Christian, you know, deaconess of the church, the whole nine yards, you know, Bible study um, every morning. What uh what uh denomination was that again? Christian. Okay. All right. So or born again, born again Protestant Christian. Pro okay, Protestant. So uh, this kind of segues into the next question I have, and that is, what is your family and your friends? And you said you have a girlfriend that's in Canada. What do they all think about your endeavors in the flat Earth clues? Well, I haven't been committed yet, which is which is good <laughs> to any sort of mental institution. Or, or state institution. Um, okay, when it comes to... Here's the thing. I was eccentric enough as a kid uh, that when this came about, it didn't really... It, yeah, it surprised people, but not much. Because it's like, it's like you know, they raised an eyebrow, but one's like, oh yeah, Mark's doing it? Pfft. Yeah, this is not a huge shock. 
because anyone that would really the fireworks thing was what put him put put me on the map there that and you know playing video games for a living and never get not getting married or having kids so i was just doing my own thing for years and years uh but the fireworks thing you know how many how many people do you know kids that you know decide that during college that they're just going to start up with their own fireworks operation and hire students to do that that's way outside the lines and (laughs) so and you know, the ATF getting involved. I mean, there's some great stories. You know, I've got them on uh, Strange World. I recorded uh, some, you know, exactly how everything went down. So there was some break in the action. So when I was out in Colorado doing the video game stuff, yeah, yeah, it's like, oh, well, Mark seems to be, you know, living a fairly normal life. Blah blah blah. And then this came along. And it's like, oh crap! You know, now you know, this 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 will be my uh, my opus my whatever it is and again i i'm not going to take credit for most of it because it i didn't wake up wanting to do this it just seemed to have found me you know i i i I, people think it's weird you know and and i have had some people from the christian faith saying oh you've been touched you've been you've been uh, chosen by god to do this it's like i don't know but i will say this when i woke up to the the, you know knowing full well i was going to do the clues I could hear the narrative for the clues in my own voice. I was hearing my own narrative. You know, it's not like I was hearing other people's voices. I was hearing my voice. And, and it wasn't saying, like, you should do this and then kill all your family. It was it was <laughs> saying, you know, it was just saying, okay, here's the clues. You know, and, and the Reader's Digest edition, you know, Admiral Bird, blah, blah. You're just going down the line. It's like, okay, all right, I'm just going to start typing this. And I've never written anything. I've never written so much without backtracking and omitting paragraphs and doing a lot of grammar checking. You know, I just wrote it out and then I made subtle corrections as I was reading it. So, yeah, it, you know, I, it just, just came to me. Chuck, what were you going to say? No, I was just trying to catch a breath without having to come over the mic. <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess I was being on a question here is that um, all right out of um, all your flat earth clues which yeah. one do you think is the most convincing convincing yeah. uh, probably the one that I don't even have on this list here which is the introduction because the introduction was my testing to the waters and at the I think at the end of the introduction I told people to I, I I was dumb enough to actually put my phone number, my real phone number, at the end of the introduction, because I, I honestly I was just going into it I was like, okay, you know what? If you got questions, call me. Here's my phone number. I know nobody uses the phone anymore because everybody texts, and now my I have to screen my my phone constantly because the calls just never stop. I have voicemails and voicemails and voicemails, which is impressive considering nobody calls, but yet there's a whole bunch of people that do. Is the most convincing one? Yeah, probably was the first one because it gets people thinking. Um, however, the peop- that's the one I think it is. The one that people tell me is the most convincing is, is number two, which is the bird wall. So if number one was the empty theater, and people say, and I, I think Rob Skiba told me, oh, that's your weakest. You shouldn't have led with that. And I'm going, are you kidding? I loved empty theater. But bird wall was the one that most people, ca- it caught them off guard. It was something nobody knew, including me. You know, I was into hollow earth theory. I knew exactly who Admiral Bird was. I had no idea that Admiral Byrd had anything to do with the uh, the flat Earth theory, and neither did anybody else. So when I and you know when I uncovered that and put it out there, it really got to people. It's like oh, and you know because you know, the combination of that with the footage of him on that news program, you know that sixty minutes type program, and following that you know with the Antarctic tr- treaty and which up yourselves. Like, hey, look, you know Byrd. Down there, and then they locked the whole sucker down. You can't go there now. That really was a, t- a telling point for a lot of people. Uh, was it m- my favorite clue of all? No. The one I enjoyed, just I don't know if this is a follow up question f- from you or not. The one I enjoyed more than any making of him was, was uh, Creative Force because the people that wrote me on that were super emotional about it because I was trying to make it sort of a pick me up and inspirational type of thing, which wasn't a clue as much kind of like a reason why. And I had people leaving me voicemails crying or writing me emails. They were crying. There's a lot of crying 
And, <laughs> and I knew, I knew they were going to cry too, because when, you know, I had that again, the you know, I woke up that next morning because I was making one per day and I stopped after number eight. I woke up that morning with some of the dialogue for creative force. And I actually had a tear in my eye when I was going through the dialogue in my head. I was going, oh, this is pretty good. So, you know, I knew it was going to have some influence. Now, some people didn't like it as much, you know, because there was you know, the same people that, that when they watched Contact, the movie with Jodie Foster, were disappointed because there wasn't some real green, scaly alien at the end. But I still enjoyed it. Uh, I got to say, I actually really liked Creative Force uh, a lot, too. And uh, the thing that actually stuck with me out of all that was how you're talking about how the, how the uh, enclosed system was created for us. And, uh, and I believe that's the correct video, right? Um, yeah, yeah, that absolutely was. Um, yeah, yeah, because people were telling me, you know, it's like, man, you're you're um, you're hitting us too too hard, and and I'm getting all claustrophobic, and and you know, you're turning the world into a, a one bedroom apartment, and yeah, that's why I did the intro for. It. I said, okay, let's see if we can put this in perspective, and you know, try to make you feel a little less, um, you know, panicky about it and it turned out to be again I, I thought a really really solid clue but uh you know so, some people have their favorite you know i still get people to say oh yeah this is my favorite or this is my favorite uh the one i get more criticism than any is um death perception when it talks about my ideas about the magma system and volcanoes and and uh, you know what's beneath us because it was short real to the point and some people really didn't like dealing with that you know it's like oh you're taking a leap there i was going look if you have a better idea of how those things underneath us work let me know and to date nobody's done it but they still don't like my explanation it's like fine you know you can say what you want critics are we all um mm. let's go ahead and get into these uh clues since we've already kind of talked about a lot of them um sure. we have the uh the empty theater and in, in this clue you basically talk about in a sense, it's almost like it's where you're talking about a psyop by Hollywood to convince us that the world is round, and they're using the media outlets, they're using um, science and NASA and all that um, in the movies to a certain degree. Uh, movies like you mentioned, Mission to Mars, Mars Attacks, Independence Day, um, about, and uh, you also show the complete lack of movies. Um, regarding anything realistic about the supposed mission or uh, the uh, lunar missions um, yep. orbiting in space you have a real distaste for the uh, space station supposedly circling us right now <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, and uh, so yeah go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about this uh, clue on the Shh. empty theater Sure, sure, sure. The uh, the empty theater was initially just kind of a uh, an information probing that I was doing because I was I was there's something was bugging me about mainstream media and it's like yeah we you know because I'm a huge media guy I have watched so many movies in the theater not down I mean I've downloaded a lot of movies too and watched a lot of movies on DVD but I'm one of those guys that went to the theater probably four to five times a month by myself because I you know I didn't want to wait for other people. It's like, look, if it opens up this weekend and I can't get anyone to go with me, I'm going. And then after a while, it's like, you know what? I'm just going. I don't care if you go with me. And I watched a lot of science fiction. You know, every Star Wars movie, every Star Trek movie, uh, you know, and, and all the television series that go along with it. And I realized after a while, I was going, okay, there's, there's really three types of movies. There's your, your heavy science fiction, your science fiction fantasy, you know, everything from Star Wars to Star Trek to Battlestar Galactica to take your pick. And then there's a second level, which is uh, sort of pseudo-future movies, things that you think, you know, technology that's 20, 30 years ahead of us that we're really close to now, like Mission to Mars, like Red Planet. Uh, Interstellar, eh, kind of. The Martian with Matt Damon, if you want to throw in stuff that's recent. Gravity with uh, Sandra Bullock and George Clooney. And those movies are pretty good. You know, those are, but they, they blur the lines between fantasy space and real space. Where it gets interesting is when you try to find real space movies. Even ones that are you know based on, on actual events. And there's only two that have ever, ever been done. And if you're old enough to remember, there was the 1983 The Right Stuff, which was, you know, covered the early space program, basically the astronaut recruiting, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, recruiting scenario and low Earth orbit. 
but it was almost there was almost nothing that was done in space. All the all, the movie was three hours long and it was all shot on the ground. It was all just you know how the astronauts were going to do this and do this, and it was almost none of it was in space. And it won Academy Awards and only lost Best Picture to Gandhi, with uh, that was with Ben Kingsley, and yet they didn't do a sequel to it. And I was I was going that's really curious why why would you not do a sequel? I mean Hollywood make if there's a nickel to be made Hollywood is going to make a sequel, and they didn't do it. And nothing was made after that until 1995 when they did Apollo 13, which, interestingly enough, was the only Apollo mission which didn't land on the moon, if you don't count the ones that were just in low Earth orbit, which were 8, uh, eight and 9, 8, 9, and 10. Well, it doesn't matter. The point is, is that Apollo 13, that was the only other movie. And that was it from 1995 up until now. There has never been a real space movie, actual space based on real events. And the closest television show they ever did, which, again, not a coincidence, was because Tom Hanks was involved. He was one of the four stars in Apollo 13. He helped produce a uh, uh, HBO series called From the Earth to the Moon. And it was like a 10-part series. I watched the entire series. It was utter crap. (laughs) And it didn't get any network play. And we you know those special effects were awful. Even for 1998, they were they were bad. And that was it. But, you know, nobody's done er- anything ever since. And you've got to wonder why. It's like, look, Hollywood, and, and I actually had Stanton Friedman in a debate with me, said, well, it'd be boring. No one would watch it. I was going, dude, America makes some of the worst movies you'd ever. We make horrible movies. You know, if for every good one that we make, there's a hundred bad ones. You know, straight to DVD pieces of crap. You know, and and if there is a if if a movie makes literally a nickel of profit, they're gonna make another one. You know, for God's sakes, we made a sequel. No offense if you guys watched it. We made a sequel to uh, Paul Blart Mall Cop. Oh my gosh, you're right. About we made a that. sequel to that. <laughs> you know, there's movies and there's that's just one example. There are plenty. I mean, how many earnest movies did we have back in the day? We've had also if again if it makes money they're going to make the, they're going to do it so and again we already proved that they can make money with the right stuff so why didn't they and that's because it hit too close to home you don't want the producers you don't want the studios going down that road making the movie you know using NASA as consultants and then realizing it's like hey wait a minute you know this looks just like the real thing and then you're thinking well. So what's the difference between this and the real thing? And then the lines start blurring, and that was that was basically the empty theater. It was you know I won't I won't go into it more than that. But that's that was it's like look it, there's a lot of blurred lines here, and a lot of the science fiction movies that you're watching are just reinforcing the gaps that should be filled with real events but aren't. You know so that's where we were. Um, so do you believe that Hollywood is intentionally and knowledgeably reinforcing the idea of, no. the, of the globe? No, no, no. They don't know. Uh, the, in fact, all you'd need to do, because I tried to put myself when it, during this entire process, I was trying to put myself in the authorities' shoes. You know, the people that have, have been covering this up, and you don't need that many people to do it. You just need some clever producers in the right places with the right amount of money. You know, which is you get producers to make certain things. You know, producers are just money men. That's all they do. You know, they're not directors, they're not actors, they're not studios. They're just people with money. You just get producers in certain places to make things to reinforce it. You know, you encourage science fiction movies. You encourage near science fiction movies. You do not encourage, spa- you know, real life space movies. If you can have, you know, why was why has there never been an Apollo moon movie, ever, 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 ever? In fact, why did um, there was a movie that came out uh, I don't know less than ten years ago called Moon, right? That was the entire title of the movie, Moon, right? It was a science fiction movie starring Sam Rockwell about clones mining in the future on the moon. Why had that title never been trademarked before recently? Now, that movie should have been trademarked by NASA immediately. They should have sat on that thing and said, nobody gets to make a moon movie except for us. Or we will pick the studio that makes a moon movie. Never, ever been done. So, no, Hollywood does not know. Uh, they, you know, there's a few, yeah, I'm sure there's a few producers, you know, government people that are, that are throwing money in different places. But for the most part, uh, the, the studios are just going, you know, they're just told it's like, well, you know, well, if they're encouraged to make war movies, they're going to make war movies, they're encouraged to make space movies, they're going to make space movies. They don't care. They, they're not even going to ask the reason why they're just going to make them. 
And um, since you are um, blowing the whistle on the, uh, the conspiracy to hide the flat Earth, uh, mm -hmm. do you think Hollywood will start uh, putting out movies actually attempting to document the lunar landings? Uh, I would think that's just it. If they haven't by now, unfortunately, they're too late because – and this is something I talked about with uh, other – like the Orion Project, but I'll use I'll use your moon landing thing just for a reference. It's a, it's a good question, which is they can't do it now because the internet detection ability, the hive mind of the internet – and by that I mean the nerds that are out there at three in the morning looking frame by frame through everything – they are going to find – mistakes if you make a moon movie right now if you try you know you say you're whoever whatever studio you go out and try to make a moon movie right now you're gonna have a real problem because you either have to replicate what nasa showed you you know from the 1960s or you're gonna have to wing it and kind of change it a little bit and either way you're gonna expose way too many people to sets and production techniques which hit too close to the mark. They are, you know, I, I use, which is why I use the clip from Rammstein, that rock band from Germany. We are living in America. They actually went out and, and an empty warehouse in Germany created their own moon set. And it is spot on. And they, you know, if you look at like the making of that movie, the behind the scenes, it cost a little bit of money, but for the most part, they did. You know, we're talking about just a rock video, you know, not top of the line production guys, but you know, <laughs> Germans are good. But they created an almost identical set, and I'm sure that the guys that were, you know, it was a jab because remember, outside of this country, outside of the United States, where you're broadcasting, a lot of countries are suspicious of anything America does, and which is why I'm still amazed that that more people outside of the United States believe that. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, who told you you went to the moon? Oh, the Americans? Oh, yeah, because the Americans would never lie to you about anything. American government? <laughs> oh, never, ever do it. So, no, they can't. You can't You can't make an Apollo movie now. I mean, you could try, I suppose, but it's good. You know, you're you're just adding fuel to the fire. The Flat Earth community at this point would, would just jump on it and tear it to shreds uh, because you're giving them – you're giving people – especially cause now because it's going to be HD, 4K – you know, you're you're giving people access to techniques now. Now we can look even cl clearer images of what's going on there, and then you can compare them. the The worst part is the big reason. Other, other reason you can't do it is then you're going to compare the movie to the real stuff, and the discrepancies are going to tell two different stories, and you can't do it. That's why they haven't done it. It's why the same reason why they only released one full Earth in sunlight picture from 1972 to 2015. They didn't want to take the chance, so they just milked the same picture, the same single shot, for 43 years. Uh, you, you, you know, same reason why they're never going to do an Orion project. Oh yeah, Elon Musk is going to come on television and say, "Oh, we're going to colonize Mars." Blah blah blah. You're never going anywhere. He's going to kick that can down the road for as long as he can. You can't. You cannot fake a mission to Mars uh, because the production uh, techniques would show flaws, and there are people out there on the internet that just live to dissect any media that has flaws. And you say, well, it's real life. It won't have flaws. I was going, yeah, that's fine. So explain how a $200 million movie uh, shows up on moviemistakes.com with like 50 different mistakes. Hmm. It's because you know, even with that much money, people are human. They, they make errors. So essentially what you're saying is just just recapping exactly what you just said, and that is uh, people, if, if it's fake, it's coming out. It's just a matter of time, essentially, right? Yeah, yeah. It's there's only so much you can do. I, I, I kid it, but eh, you know what? I'm not kidding. If somebody, if I was a government agent, which I have been accused of from time to time, if I was a government agent and somebody came to me with a dump truck full of money and said, "Okay, you're going to do the fake Orion project, which is the Mars mission." Uh, we'll, you know, we'll give you, you know, X number of years and you can have access to all, any Hollywood people you want. I go, uh, are you nuts? I, it, it doesn't matter how much money you have. You can't, you can't fake it. You, uh, you know, you'd have to pre-record everything. You'd have to run it through massive amounts of focus groups and filters. You'd have to kill a lot of people. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there's no way you could do it. You can't do it. And the reason why it, 
those people who are listening out there, if they don't understand like moviemistakes.com and moviebloopers.com, the reason why movies make mistakes is because during production, a movie is shot out of sequence. It's not shot like real life where you just leave the camera running and you just, you know, it starts from A, you know, and, and works its way you know, until sundown. In in movies, you shoot things based on location. So it's like, okay, we'll shoot all the desert scenes at the same time. And we'll shoot all the mountain scenes and all the forest scenes and all the interior scenes and all the exterior scenes. And you try to shoot them all at the same time, but you're shooting them out of chronological sequence. And on top of that, if you have you miss something and you have to go back and do a reshoot, you've got to rebuild the set. Because remember, you strike the set, you you know, you get rid of it. You have to rebuild the set almost identical. And oh, so many people make mistakes. I mean, if there's a, literally if a coffee cup moves from one side of the room to the other without the actor moving it, some guy's gonna find it at three o'clock in the morning in the middle <laughs> of Iowa, and they're gonna call you. <laughs> Blast you, internet hive mind. It's true. They they will. <laughs> and movies movies just. I mean, movies have gotten better because of it, because people will find it. But they do find it. I mean, I look at even like first first run things of Lord of the Rings, uh, you know, epic movies, Titanic. I mean, there's all, all sorts of fun mistakes that are made because it's not real. It's not real life. Mistakes are not you know are made in not real life. Like that movie, uh, I think it was Ben Hur, where they were marching down the road with the chariots, and yep. one of the movie mistakes that they had was everybody was wearing modern day watches. Yeah, yeah. sure. Like, sure. How, do you, I mean, how do you miss so, that? <laughs> yeah, there's so many movie mistakes out there, uh, and and people take pride on it. That you know, now there's motivation. I mean, there's money to be made in websites that promote this. Again, you know, find how many blooper sites there are. Go to go to YouTube, you know, just type in blooper or movie mistakes or gag reels. You know, movie mistakes have been made. Uh, a little trivia for you. Movie, movie uh, mistakes have been highlighted for 70 years. Uh, they used to be Christmas uh, gag reels for uh, for Hollywood parties. Because, you know, there was no internet, there was no television or anything like that. So they would take take all the bloopers and put them in a reel and then show them to all the uh, drunk studio execs during Christmas. That was that was one of the things they did. And oh. it just kept, never died. It, it's still funny. I still watch blooper reels because it, it breaks the illusion of a, of a lot of different things. I, I showed one on my uh, Strange World. Uh, I use little opening clips. And I showed some Star Trek Next Generation bloopers, which most people don't see. And, you know, it totally shuts down the illusion. You realize, you know, even though you watch them for, what, eight, nine seasons, it's like, holy smokes, I keep forgetting. They're all actors. And I'm emotionally invested in this show. I know. Exactly. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and, I, I mean, I would love to go through all these clues, but there's so many of them, so... Um, I, I don't think that's going to be possible. In, in that's okay. You just... want to pick your favorite? Pick your favorites? Well, there's a few actually. My favorite, and and I don't want to talk about it yet because I think the other one more people would find uh, fascinating, and you already know which one that's going to be. But uh, my personal favorite's Map Makers, and the reason why I like it is because it's it's uh it's it's a in a sense it's a provable theory, and this is one of the ones that I pointed out to uh, Gwen, my girlfriend. Um, she was asking me. She was saying we were talking about the whole flights thing and all that and uh she was like you know they could be picking up people in different countries and i was like well yeah and then i talked to her about the ae map and all that and and i started showing that to her and she was she had no answer she was like oh okay wow and and i was just showing her um how those flights don't make sense on a globe but they make total sense on a azimuthal uh, equidistant map yeah. and uh, i was showing that to her so that's my favorite. I don't want to talk about that yet, but I do want to talk about um, the bird wall. Okay. Um, and uh, you were discussing the exploration of Admiral Bird, which, on, as a side note, um, I, you were talking about how you were a big uh, believer in the Hollow Earth and um, Admiral Bird. Uh, yeah. Of course, uh, we all know uh, if we've been following the whole uh, flat flat Earth clues and all that that he was involved in the Hollow Earth. Um, so in my mind, it wasn't really a big leap for you to jump from a hollow earth to a flat earth with all that. Um, no, no, it wasn't. I'm pretty open minded anyway. You know, I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I will bend my perceptions pretty quickly. So when I was looking at the hollow earth and I was a big enough believer in the hollow earth that I actually remember taking a trip with a, a, a friend of mine to Mount Shasta, California years ago to look for hollow earth openings that were supposedly near Mount Shasta, you know, secret caves and stuff like that. 
I, I'm, you know, actually got and drove from Colorado all the way out to, um, to, to California for that. And so when I looked at this, I thought, okay, you know, I kept seeing Admiral Byrd showing up. I knew, I knew full well, you know, the diary and how he supposedly flew into the North Pole entrance and so, you know, the whole journey of the center of the earth thing. But then the rest of his life, he never went back to the North Pole. It was all South Pole, so especially in Antarctica, you know, and we're talking from 1928 all the way to his last mission in 1956, the better part of, of 30 years. And it really stuck out to me because of all the moves that were made, again, which is why I convinced enough people, or at least made people, you know, uh, scratch their heads enough to where they're going, okay, I don't have an answer for this which was he's looking for something down there for 30 years. He's a pilot. He's an explorer. You know, he's an admiral, the youngest admiral in the history of the United States Navy. You know, he was, he was the guy, literally the guy. You know, you shoulder tapped someone higher than him, shoulder tapped him and said, look, we're going to give you every exploration thing you could ever want. Find, you know, go down there and you're going to look for something. And, you know, I'm sure he's like, what am I looking for? And they're like, you know what? You'll know when you find it. Hmm. And he's looking and he's looking and he's looking. And I think they gave up by 1954, which is still a long time, 1928 to 1954, when he goes on that show, the uh, Long Jeans Chronoscope on CBS. And he goes on and he, and he tells people about how the, uh, that Antarctica is made out of money. And that everybody's down there, and it's going to be disputes over it soon. You know, there's there's coal, there's oil, there's uranium, there's minerals, and everybody's down there. You know, um, Australia, Argentina, Great Britain, Russia, Chile. Is, is, you know, it goes on and on and on. And then, and and they they were going to make money off of it. I mean, the, the you know, when he opens and says, "Look, there's a mountain range made out of coal that will supply the entire world." You know, which we could actually use now because you know, coal is not as cheap as it used to be. Um, and then he goes down and he's talking about the mission, 1955-1956 deep freeze, which he's going to go down to shortly after that, that broadcast. And he goes down there and then something happens. He finds something and whatever it was, everything changed. The world changed literally at that point. In fact, if I had to make a screenplay, uh, a movie based on this, you would open with that which was Admiral Byrd finding this thing because everybody everybody in positions of power had to make moves that as subtle as they were about it were so huge that they, they weren't going to be unnoticed forever. One of which was, of course, the, uh, the high altitude nuclear explosion tests from 1958 to 1962 where Russia, the United States, the only people with nuclear uh, – uh, weapon, weapon capabilities, they were firing missiles straight up, followed by the creation of NASA in 1958, followed by the, the announcement of the Van Allen belts in 1959, simultaneously with the locking down of Antarctica in 1959 with the Antarctic Treaty, the only treaty that has been ratified by every uh, economic power on Earth, and it is still in effect, the only unbroken treaty uh, that, that unilaterally nobody questions. And it's not even up for debate until the year 2041. Uh, it's it, it was incredible all these moves because as I was going through this stuff, I was trying to, I was trying to think. I love putting myself in in the bad guy's shoes. Well, maybe not the bad guy, but the greater good's shoes. And I try to say, okay, if I had to hide the world, how exactly would I do it? And you know, it's it's time and money. That's the big thing. So that's what they did. They they sealed off the upper edge and the outer edge. They said, oh, yeah, there's a huge belt of ra radiation. Uh, no one should ever, ever go up there. And the only people that are up there right now are the United States government and the Soviet government. So you don't have to worry about that. And Antarctica, nobody ever, ever goes to go there to do anything ever. Ever. Did, did they uh, – whenever they – so – what you're saying is that uh, they sent Admiral Byrd down there because they knew that the edge of the – basically the edge of the world was at Antarctica. was somewhere out there in the, in the frozen wasteland, um, otherwise known in the, the, from the, uh, the book of Jasher as the land of ice and snow and more ice and more snow. So the distance – we still don't know what it is, uh, although it's got to be several thousand miles. The distance from the Antarctic coastline to wherever the edge is – and by that, I don't mean an edge where you fall off into space because people keep thinking there is space and 
who says there has to be. I'm just saying some sort of barrier like a snow globe edge. Uh, it has to be several thousand miles. And it took him the better part of 30 years to find it because he was flying in all directions. You got to set up refueling things on the, on the ice. You may basically, you have to do this weird leapfrog thing where you're setting up fuel depots farther out. You, you land, you set up fuel, you come back, you get more fuel. And then, you know, you can just keep trying to extend it from there. You have to set up small camps. And when he found what he found, everybody got off the ice at the same time. Every country that was down there. They they were like oh, you know what we're we're leaving they, seriously it, it was like it, it was like you were watching a, a horror movie I was like what did you see out there was it Godzilla was it giant frost beans was it you know was it was a it was a, a huge spaceship what you find out there and nobody talks about it um, what we do know though uh, well and then we'll throw one more interesting thing about Antarctic into the mix the only time where we weren't where Bird wasn't going down there was during World War II, you know, where he got his part of his admiral status. But you know who was down there during World War There was only one country down there in World War II. Do you know who it was? Uh, I'm going to guess Germany. Germany, absolutely. Germany. So, yeah, this, the Indiana Jones stories were not, were not that far off the mark, which was Germany was looking for any magical – why wouldn't you? You know, if you want to win, if you want to take the world – you're going to follow every lead you can. It's like, hey, here's a magic thing that might help you win the war. Hey, there's this magic thing that might help you win the war. Hey, there's something freaky in Antarctica. Maybe you should go check that out. Germany's down there. And I think they part of their force stayed down there after they lost in Europe because Operation High Jump, which was 1946, right after the surrender of Japan, uh, Admiral Byrd went down with a massive carrier fleet, you know, full-blown supply, you know, every 13 ships, thousands of men. And engaged in something and people saying oh you know what happened what happened you know where did what happened with the germans i go i don't know what happened with the germans but i know the germans weren't a threat anymore because by 1954 when he went on television it wasn't even an issue he was like oh yeah we're everyone's going down there to make money so what happened to the germans you know did they find a way off were they did they ask for asylum how you know what were they wiped out who knows but whatever they whatever happened to them they weren't a threat Sorry, that was my rant. No it was very good. Um, but, <laughs> uh, um, and um, next question on that, though, for this whole thing was, why was Admiral Byrd allowed to do an interview on TV? Where he well, that's, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. I, I don't, because he was allowed to do an interview because he didn't know. I think the powers that be didn't know, until you know, and it was something I've, I've thrown out there for at least a year now, which is, yeah, so fine. Let's say you were given a map that shows what the real world looks like 500 years ago. So what? You don't have the technology to exploit it. Uh, you have wooden ships and horses. That's it, which means you're not going to Antarctica because Antarctica, even the parts we they are shown to the public, are extremely hostile. And you've got 200-foot walls of ice starting from the shoreline going straight up. Try to find a beachhead there, an easy beachhead, not easy to do. Then from there, it slopes up to two miles. It's a plateau with no plant life, no animal life, no ruins. Whatever supplies you bring, that's it. So the whole place just screams, go away. So in his case, he and so let's say, for example, you find, you have these maps. Eventually, you know, you send your best guy. In this case, it was Richard Bird. And he goes down there. They let him go on television because I think they had given up. Because really, after, what, 1928 to 1954, that's 26 years? 26 years, that's plenty long enough to not find something. So I think it's like, you know, they're probably looking at their maps. You know, this is Murphy's Law. You know, look at their maps going, well, pfft, obviously nothing down there. Let's just uh, let's make money. That's basically why, you know, at that point he goes on television and is hyping up the companies. It's like, yeah, let's, let's get this sucker going. Let's get the minerals. Let's get Alcoa down there and ExxonMobil and Shell and British Petroleum. Let's get them all down there. Let's just start doing this. And that's, again, that was one of the most glaring things for me because that's the last thing you want to do if you're actually trying to hide the place, which meant at the time they didn't know. It was only, you know, the, again, very next mission, who knows who, you know, what spot, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, let's check out this map, you know, you know F, F32, we haven't gone there yet, they go there, and all of a sudden, there it is, and it's like, ah, crap, you know, Murphy's Law says that, you know, because they went on television, 
and said that, oh, yeah, the place is you know, open. We're going to be down there for the next hundred years. The very next year, they seal it off forever. And no one, you know, to this day, again, the, the, the corporations, I'll, I'll throw one more thing at you. It's the, it's the corporations that bug me more than anything, because if you're an oil company, you can do anything you want. There's no politician that can stop you. No, there's no military that can ta- stop you for the most part, you know, because you bought, you own your side of the military, and they're not even, they're not allowed to go down there, not, not even allowed to talk about it. Now, that being said, I think Richard Byrd enjoyed his press conferences and his television things way too much, uh, because he was an explorer, and so when he was told, you know, it's like, yeah, we're keeping this under wraps, I think he objected, and I think they could see that he was gonna slip up eventually, during his tours and then what do you know he died of a heart attack at his house the very next year and so he either died because he reached the end of the world and he, and he figured out he couldn't explore anymore he died of a broken heart which is kind of a stretch or more realistically the powers that be said yeah we're you know we, we, we what else what use did they have for him at that point he had served his purpose. He had right. searched for 30 years they didn't need him anymore and they couldn't trust him so you know Take take care of him on that side and, and make sure all his records are taken care of. Time to take a nap. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he looked like he was in pretty good shape. He was only like 65, 67, and he led all his exploring things. You know, he was dressed up in skins, and you know, he was he was, he was was way better than Indiana Jones could ever be portrayed. I mean, he was his own guy and a self-made man, and I mean, seriously, he was... He was uh, he was the key behind this whole thing, and uh, I, I we were we were lucky to get the CBS footage that is out on YouTube. All right, and uh, now the question is, what was the purpose of Operation Highway? And high high jump. They thinking? All right. High, high um, jump, I think it was to I think it was to root out <laughs> Highway is actually not bad. I'm sorry, <laughs> that was my. Point. I I I think that it was to root out the remaining Nazi forces, and. The, the 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 myth goes or the legend goes the one I like the best was that Nazi they were outgunned the the Nazi forces were outgunned but that they're one of the older civilizations was down there and by that I mean someone that's either older than you know people that have lived here in this place this building longer than us but an advanced civilization was down there and I think the Nazi uh, forces asked them for asylum uh, and the myth goes and I didn't write this somebody else wrote this was that when you ask for asylum, it's a one-way ticket, saying, all right, fine, you can, you know, you, you can come out of here, and, you know, you can leave this place, but you can't come back. It's kind of like a junior high dance type of thing. You know, once you leave, no, nope, you're not drinking in the parking lot and then causing trouble and you come back. That's it. You're done. And that was it. They, they, they took the asylum, and that was, that was the extent of it, and the Americans couldn't follow, and, and whoever else was down there. Uh, but either way, they were taken care of. The Nazis were uh, no longer a threat once a high jump was over. Now, now on a – and I'm, I'm actually kind of forcing Chuck to ask questions because he's more shy than I am. I'm like you. I could, I could talk without a problem, but he, uh, he's actually never done this before, so – I'm like, you're going to ask these questions whether you want to or not. <laughs> I recommend hyperventilating, Chuck. So, <laughs> no, no, it's it's totally that. cool. Look, it, it, you know, when it comes to this, I, I absolutely know where you're talking from. I was, I don't think I slept during my first uh, uh, Strange World show or like the first three or four interviews. I get super, super amped up. And even after this one tonight, I, I probably won't sleep as much as I should. So. <laughs> Um, so if I'm understanding my – okay, so was Operation High Jump after the uh, the chron- chronoscope show? No, it was before. It was? Operation High Jump Operation High Jump was literally right after the surrender of the Japanese. Okay. In 19, so the Japanese surrendered in 1945. High Jump was 46. The chronoscope was 1954. And Operation Deep Freeze, his last mission was 1955. Going into 1956. Okay, deep freeze. And he died. In, and he died in 1957. Okay, I was making sure I understood. I had my uh, my events in correct order. Yep. Um, the as I said, my personal favorite one, Map Makers. Here uh, you uh, talk about the USGS, um, mm-hmm. and uh, basically how they're kind of creating distorted maps in a certain way. 
Um, you yeah. also talk about the az- azimuthal. That's a mouthful of word right there. Yeah, I, I've said it enough that it doesn't bother me anymore, the azimuthal equidistant map. Uh, but you can call it AE for short uh, or whatever you want to call it. And some people just call it the flat earth map because it's still the best map we've got going. People are trying to redraw it uh, with different perspectives. That's the one thing we don't know for sure. But if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you're trying to you're trying to envision it, and I and I yeah I could say yeah fine you take a globe you put your hand on the North Pole and you flatten it. But the easier way to think of it is just look up the UN flag. That's it. The UN flag is identical to it. And that was also another thing when I was looking through, uh, looking for information on on the flat Earth. That's what I found most interesting was out of all the list of map projections in Wiki. This was the only one that was actually tied to anything. It was, and it was tied to multiple things, which was interesting. Um, one, it was created by the whole projection system was created by uh, a thousand-year-old Persian scientist, which is now Iran, uh, called, named Al Biruni. And I never heard of Al Biruni before, but there's a moon crater. Well, you know, NASA named a moon crater after him. It was out the Al Biruni moon crater, and. It's also listed as the um, uh, the U. It's also listed in the catalog of the United States Geologic Survey maps as a projection of the world, and it is also the model for the UN flag. All these things, all listed in the same map. It's the you know if you go down, there's nothing else. You know, the, no no other map has this this sort of these connections, but it is also the Flat Earth Society's map. But if you go to the Flat Earth Society. In Wiki, that map is not linked back to the AE map, even though they're absolutely identical. So every other map is considered perfectly sane. The U.S. the, the government, the United States government version, the um, the UN flag version, the projection that's perfectly fine, until you say that it's literal. If you say that it's literal, then you're crazy. And I thought that was really, really intriguing. It's like, why, why would you, you know, it's, it sticks out like a sore thumb. No other map can lay this claim. You know, even the dispute between the Mercator map, which we see, you know, when you pull down the maps in the classroom, even, even though we know, like, for example, um, that map is wrong and the correct perspective is actually the Gall Peters map. If you guys want to look the, that's Gall, G-A-L-L, Peters, P-E-T-E-R-S. That shows the more correct perspective. We won't even show kids the Gall Peters map. That has nothing to do with flat Earth. Uh, it is it, because it's people are more comfortable using the 500 year old map, which severely distorts the relative size of the continents. So it's again part, politics do play you know into some of this, but it's uh, but it's very very interesting. So yeah, when I was digging into the map makers, that's why map makers was number three. It was another thing for people to really. You could again, none of this information. The best part of when I was doing the clues was none of this information was secret. You can go look it up yourself. I mean, it's all. In fact, none of it's even been changed since I've done these. They, you can go out there right now and look up the AE map. You can look up the you know Richard Bird, the television interview. You know, without looking at my clues, all this stuff is is fully available to everybody, and that's why um, it was easy to check. Even the flights. You know that's that's the best part because everyone has a different way of, of looking up flights and uh, some some good stuff is out there. But again, all of it is available to anybody. It is not like as oh I d- dug into a secret secret archive that's been erased since then. No no no, it's all out there now. So which is why I said you know I don't don't believe me. Just do your own research. So the best uh, perspective of the flat Earth you believe is the uh, azimuthal equidistant map. It is right now. Okay. Again, there's, there's people that like anybody, you know, anything. You put something out there, people are going to fidget enough and try to mess with it. And uh, you know, the, the, there's two questions you have to ask with it. One is, is it perfectly flat? Meaning, if you laid the map out on a table, are there any dips or bulges or anything to it? Because I used to believe more, and I'm still not completely, uh, uh, you know, denying it. The flat and stationary Earth map, which is basically the AE map, it was done in uh, the 1830s, 1880s, 1830s by I can't remember now, by uh, Orlando Ferguson, and which is kind of shaped like a hubcap, where the North Pole's kind of got a bulge in the center, and then it kind of dips down and it kind of raises up at the side with Antarctica. Uh, I used to say roulette table because that was easier for people to remember because some people don't remember old hubcaps, but I can't say roulette table because again the internet hive mind misses nothing and apparently if you add up all the numbers on a roulette table it adds up to 666 
which is true, <laughs> which is true, and I did not know. So now I was like, okay, it's a hub, it's a hubcap. Leave it to leave it to the internet oh, yeah. hive mind to link the flat Earth to the Antichrist. Oh yeah, they will they will make connections. No no uh, no question. So yeah, the AE map is is the one that we're using right now. I mean, it's the closest thing we got, and and really the the UN flag is the most you know if the un flag has it that's the one that i go with and the matt boylan story the famous matt boylan story where the uh, the nasa engineer you know writes you know is drawing in chalk what the world really looks like and and he's matt said when he was done it looked like the un flag so yeah that's what i'm using for now hmm. you know is the perspective perfect is the scale perfect eh, maybe not but it's uh, what we can say, and this is the best part I love about the flat Earth community is that everybody is on the same page when we say, "Look, it's not a globe." Yeah, you can you can say whatever you can make up whatever shape you want, but what we do know it is absolutely one hundred percent not a globe. And someone has gone to amazing lengths to hide this from you, and you gotta want you know then you gotta ask why. So. Um, uh, the last question on this is, does Antarctica, do you think Antarctica circles around the edge like a ring, like in the AE map? Do you think that I that's do. actually how I, I, that, is it yeah, more like I, a wall than like its own continent almost? No, no, no. It still is its own continent, but it's more of a ring continent than it is a, um, uh, you know, a weird land. It's, it's so unique as a landmass. Uh, but yeah, so the edge of the Antarctic, you know, if you Antarctica is the only continent that if you look at a, at a flat map versus a globe, it's the only continent that doesn't look anything remotely what, you know, what it's displayed at. So in the globe model, it looks like something that's slightly uh, bigger than Australia. You know, it's, a, it's an island continent that's slightly bigger than Australia, even though supposedly Google, somebody told me this recently, that Google Maps shows that Australia is apparently twice as big as, as Antarctica in terms of coastline. I'm going, are they taking into account the ice? I'm not sure, but I think they would. Uh, but on the flat map, it is a thick ring that circles this. No matter where you go, you're going to end up there eventually if you fly, if you fly or take something straight enough. Now, how thick it is, we don't know, but it's got to be given on how long it took Admiral Byrd to figure out what he was trying to figure out, you know, 26 years. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's got to be pretty thick. So from the edge of the Antarctic coastline to wherever this end is, you know, this barrier, whatever we can't get past, uh, it's got to be several thousand miles because uh, he was using prop planes. But his planes were getting a lot better in the 30s and 40s all the way into the 50s. So, you know, they were probably able to do a couple hundred miles an hour. Uh, and I actually, I actually lied. My uh, Gwen actually asked a question earlier today. Ironically, we were at church, and uh, she uh, asked the question: Well, if the world is flat, how yeah. would north, south, east, and west work on that? There are no north, south, east, and west. North, north, south, east, and west are variable, meaning they're um, subjective. So yeah, the the center of the map is always going to be north. But you don't know where the rest of them, where the starting point is. So, yeah, you, you could just take a flat map and put, you know, north, south, east, and west, you know, the letters on there. But and somebody else could could walk up and, and put you know, the rest on there. It's, it's not going to make any difference because if the center of the map is the magnetic north, then everything points there. So it, it, there is no the, – the, the only thing we can say about north, south, and east, and west in the compass is that – the North Pole, uh, I'll throw an interesting little thing in there, whereas the north, the, the center of the map is north. You know, it's the center. If you want to call it north, you can, just for, for bearing sake, so we have no other word for it. But what's interesting is is that, because I had a, an Australian military intelligence guy uh, do a statement for me where he says, you know, it's interesting because eventually you'd think once your compass got below the equator far enough, you know, on a globe anyway, that it would flip over and the needle would eventually point south, right? It would take hmm. over. The North can't be that strong. Huh. And he had a guy tell him down there, you know, another military guy is going, he's going, yeah, dude, there is no South Pole. You know, there is no, there is no magnetic South that you can, that you can trust. In fact, if you can, it's got to be so far to the coastline that it doesn't even make sense. You know, you're, we're talking about 90% of the world always points to the North Pole. 
So if the South Pole is truly the South Pole, so yeah, and we always get confused because in school, yeah, we see the magnets, you know, we can see north and south, but it never points south. It always points north. Huh. Uh, I thought that was very, very interesting. But it makes sense because if it was the outer ring was south, it would be a weaker force. The center would be a strong force, would be north, and the south would be a weaker force. And, you know, we've just gotten used to it. And again, we've, we've swallowed everything that uh, science has fed us over the years. Wow, I never actually thought about that. I, I didn't either. <laughs> again, most of the stuff that I that I pick up isn't because I'm doing a whole bunch of research. It's because people... Other the, the hive mind is is looking and looking and looking. You know, when you, you show somebody flat Earth and they don't sleep for two weeks, they will, uh, you know, turn over a lot of rocks. Right. And some of the rocks I've never seen before. And then they'll show. You know, I get emails all the time. Have you seen this? Have you seen this? It's like sometimes it's like no, no, I have not seen this. Um, I want to go ahead and move on to clue number five because I like some of the stuff that you talk about in this clue. Uh, status quo. Um, you basically you delve into the heliocentric model and how Copernicus introduced this model. Um, you talk about the if the public finds out you. Um, I actually really like the your ideas of disclosure, how the reaction of the public would be in regards to disclosure of the uh, flat Earth model. And so, why don't you go ahead and tell us about status quo and what you discuss there? Yeah. Um... It's it comes into why, and I get a lot of questions, and uh, and I'm actually looking at the text now because I believe it or not, I don't have that many people ask me about status quo. The it goes into okay, the one of the big I, I get this probably one out of every ten questions, which is why 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 would you hide it? Why would you hide the world? And and I want I don't want to necessarily slap the people silly that ask me that, but I think they lack vision or they don't understand what power is. In that, uh, I'll take something simple, and that is, why doesn't the United States Air Force admit that there are UFOs flying around? We all know they're up there, but they, you know, and the Air Force didn't invent them. You know, it's like, yeah, fine, Roswell's been around since the 50s. UFOs have been around for a lot longer than that. You know, look up the the 1561 Nuremberg event for for a, an example. The point is, is that the United States Air Force can't admit UFOs because UFOs are better than our planes. You can't be the ultimate authority if you're not the ultimate authority. If you don't control the skies, you don't tell people you don't control the skies. You just deny it and say, oh, yeah, or hint and wink and say, oh, yeah, they're obviously ours, You know, even though you're looking over your shoulder going, holy crap, oh, they don't come down here. Uh, same thing applies here, but on a much, much bigger scale. Wow, that is quite literally, I have never thought of that in my life about how um, they can't admit to UFOs because they're better than our own technology. That oh, yeah. that puts a whole twist on the whole UFO theory that I don't think a lot of people have even thought about is, hey, you know, they're better than us, so we got to deny them. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's one of the rules of power, and that is do not undermine your own power if you can help it. You don't give – look, if you're ruling over a class of people – you do not even hint that there is something above you that's more powerful than you uh, in any capacity because it makes – it diminishes your influence, for, for lack of a better word. Uh, I'll even take you know into account the religious aspect of it, which is why science is so adamant against God. Is that is because God is something that's technically above science, at least in the power structure. So if science can dissect God and say there is no God, then science puts itself in that seat, at least temporarily, or at least in some ways. Uh, you know, even if they can, you know, say that well, God's you know this mysterious, you know, ethereal force that nobody really knows anything about. That that's kind of where I'm going with this. When you're talking about an enclosed world, you know, not not just a flat earth, but if it's a domed structure like the Truman Show, you're opening up a can of worms that cannot be – or a genie out of the bottle that cannot be put back, which is if it was created, then there is a creator. And if there is a creator, then you got a whole bunch of questions you got to answer. And a lot of people in positions of power would have to answer them. Science – 
Oof, you know, again, what's one one of the reasons I laid out, you know, what would happen if the UN announced tomorrow that the the world wasn't closed. You know, forget about every astrophysicist and astronomer uh, and observatory closing down tomorrow. Forget about the fact that every college and university in the world would have these departments shut down overnight. Uh, forget about that all the sciences, you know, hydrology, biology, geology, archaeology, anything with an ology next to it, would have to rewrite huge chunks of textbooks, if not throw a lot of them out to get altogether. Um, for even getting rid of all, you know, if you could dismiss all that stuff, which those things in itself would produce a huge amount of chaos, you still forgot about the biggest thing, which is... <clears throat> the very basis of science, and I mean the lowest common denominator version of science, the ones that told you you had a globe since you were in kindergarten, they were wrong. And 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 people, again, I'm not condemning science entirely. Science has brought some good things to the world, although there are a lot more bad things. I won't get into them right now because you know I don't know how long you want to go with this, <laughs> but. It, there are certain things which science would have to answer, which they can't. So if they were told, if if all of a sudden it's like, yeah, you spent 12 years looking at a globe, and you were told, oh yeah, by the way, we're wrong about this globe, the very faith in in anything science would be undermined, uh, and religion would take. I, I'm not picking on religion. I, you know, I mentioned this in the in the clues. I said, look, religion would have a huge responsibility because the knee jerk reaction of religion would be to attack science and destroy them mm. for because science has been beating religion into the ground for 500 years. You know, really going after them hard, and now all of a sudden you can go back and say, so you were wrong about the globe. What else were you wrong about? How about evolution? How about carbon dating? Hmm. How about the Big Bang? Uh, how about, you know, and stuff that I'd love to, you know, have, I'm still waiting to, to, to go after them. You know, how about what exactly is underneath the earth? You know, the, <laughs> the, the, is, you, you did a cross section of the world and you showed us exactly what it is 4,000 miles down, but you only dug a whole eight miles. That's less than a tenth of a percentage. How exactly do you know what's down there? Uh, you know, it's because science doesn't like putting question marks in their textbooks. So given all these things, you know, all these horrible ideas, you know, if you're saying, <laughs> and imagine if you're in a board, you know, a, a authority power structure boardroom and this is put to you, you know, and somebody says, well, maybe we should tell the public. <laughs> and they all look at you. It's like, are you insane? Do you know what potential madness would, would be caused if the public actually found out about this? The the religious side alone would – there would be pilgrimages, huge pilgrimages to the edges of the earth just to see it for themselves. Uh, you would have churches that would – the entire congregations would charter boats and snow cats and planes, and that's all they would care about, it, which is why I, I talked about in one of the other clues – which, uh, you know, you people don't like – if people are confined, the first thing we do, like any animal species, is we try to figure out our borders, you know, and the, which is you know, why the high-altitude atomic testing was done for four years when they were, you know, firing weapons at the sky. That's what people would do. People would be like, I, I got to see this. That's all anyone would care about. That's all any – and people's like, no, I still I have to go to my crappy job in the morning and my wife would still hate me and my kids wouldn't listen to me. I'm going, yeah, yeah, that's fine. But that's all menial and boring. You know, Your neighbors, that's all they would talk about. Every website, that's all they would talk about. The news channel, CNN would run this 24 hours a day. You know, every aspect of the dome and, and you know, industries would start up. Cities would move. It would, it would be – epic it would be the greatest transformation of our civilization ever it would dwarf every other transition and paradigm shift we have gone through all you take all the others combined it would not even come close to what this would do to our psyche as a whole and i'm still not even completely sure it would be peaceful you know i, I you know i'm trying to do the whole glass half full thing it's like oh yeah you know kumbaya and golden age and i'm i'm still rooting for it but at the same time, there still could be people, you know, rioting in the streets and freaking out. You know, how many people would quit their jobs tomorrow? 
how many people would uh, all of a sudden, you know, sell everything they own, and get on a boat and just walk blindly into the snow? We don't know. You know, would there be huge support groups? How many, you know, the, the, again, it would be massive. There would be so many changes. We could speculate on them for the next probably year and, and, you know, still probably not scratch the surface. So that's my rant. <laughs> Well, uh, do you think uh, Copernicus was guided by the establishment or to come up with um, this model, or do you think that was just a convenient happenstance where they could use uh, this platform to push their own guided ideas? The, the latter, the, exactly the second part, which is I think it was a combination of the powers that be and the, and I wasn't shy about saying this, the people that built the things that built the beings that built this place needed us to believe in the globe for a while meaning when and they put this into our i remember copernicus Kiss didn't even publish the thing till after he died you know that was one of his dying wishes it was like okay well, you know unless you know you know, put the book out there but don't do it until i'm long dead uh i think that because remember it was a massive leap of faith the 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 heliocentric model you know, you're you're talking. It's it, going from a flat model, which is easy by comparison, and saying that, oh yeah, by the way, if the Earth is spinning at a thousand miles an hour and it's going around the sun at sixty thousand miles an hour and it's traveling through space at half a million miles an hour and the galaxy is moving, if all these things are happening, then it's a sphere. Wow, was that a huge leap of faith? That's a lot of motion you're putting towards people that you know back in the 1500s, which didn't even know what speed was. The fastest thing was a horse back then so uh yeah i i think that he was helped along i think he, he cheated sort of like nostradamus and tesla and some of the others i think he was given some information by you know forces that were outside of his control and he ran with it but he was still too nervous whoever gave it to him obviously freaked him out because he wasn't proud enough to, to publish it before he died he held on to it for a while and even then, you know, the also you had to get the church on board, and they got, they went on. It took them a little while, but they did get on board. I think part of it was because, like, wow, well, it doesn't really change our text too much. But it, really, it did. You know, look again, look at testingtheglobe.com with, with Rob Skiba or Zen Garcia stuff. There's a lot of chapter and verse out there that reinforces it. And we just didn't look at it and, you know, couldn't see the, uh, the forest for the trees. And do you... Um believe that the only reason the sole reason for nasa was to push the globe model yes yeah it, it was a um in fact it this was something to me uh and again i know people like like letting go of things in stages uh i did not way before flat earth i did not believe in apollo i thought there was something really really wrong with it but i couldn't figure out it was driving me insane i couldn't figure out why for 10 years, I was like going, why? Why in the world would you fake it? I'm going, yeah, I mean, yeah, you could say, well, it's for American pride and, you know, the, the you know, power perceived is power achieved. The Americans went to the to the moon, so don't mess with us. You know, stars and stripes forever, blah, blah, blah. I was going, yeah, that's good, but it isn't great. It isn't a great reason. And then I got into this, and then it made so much more sense because – and anyone who's heard me do this, you know, you know the line, and that is, it's not that they wanted to fake it, or fake NASA. It's not like they wanted to create NASA. They had to. Because if you do not create NASA, eventually some of the big companies, and by that I mean the, the subcontractors for NASA, like Boeing, General Dynamics, Lockheed Martin, those guys, they're going to eventually create their own space program. And they're going to find out what you don't want them to. You have to control space. You have to militarize space. And that's what NASA is. NASA is just a – it's they're part of the DOD. They are a military wing of the U.S. government. Fine. They wear white outfits. They don't carry guns. They smile for the camera. And there's very few of them. Hmm. But they are uniquely military. Uh, you know, they were founded on the still burning embers of the Nazi war machine. You know, without Werner von Braun and all the uh, the Nazi V2 guys, it wouldn't even have happened. Uh, and, you know, the Russians got half the, the, engine, the Nazi engineers. We got the other half. And, well, coincidentally, we both built space programs, a fake space race, and, and the Soviets 
were good at some things, but they weren't as good as faking things as us. Because you know, remember, the United States is a more creative country than Russia. Russia locks down creativity in certain in certain aspects. So we have Hollywood. Hollywood has no limits for the most part. And so once Russia figured out that we could fake it better than they could, especially with the whole Stanley Kubrick thing, uh, the, that's when Russia backed out. And they said, all right, fine, you got it. I mean, we they did the legwork in the beginning. You know, they were the ones that prompted us to do it. You know, they were the ones that spent all that time in space, first man, first dog, first probe on the moon, supposedly, and then they gave up, which is the other part of the people still to this day I can't believe they miss. And that is the Americans got to the moon, the, you know, the space race. That's what it was called. But when we got to the moon, the Russians quit just entirely. They just packed it eh, just, just pack it in, shut hmm. it down, kill the lights. We don't need, you know, what are you talking about? That, that's when it gets interesting. Then they go to the moon. Then they have three guys. Then we set up a small base. Then they set up a bigger base. Then Time Magazine runs a story. You know, is the Cold War reached the moon? It's a great, it's a great <laughs> plot. But none of that happened. We got to the moon and everybody else quit, even though we kept going. You'd think that you know the Russian ones would be you know playing catch up or whatever. Never our joint mission. Nope. Hmm. Never, never, ever happened. I don't. So. I don't think anybody even. It's really good that you bring all that out because I don't think anybody even thinks about that or doesn't really know their history well enough yeah. to uh, <clears throat> piece those pieces together. Yeah, but, uh, that a, is kind of a... what happened though. Is well, you got to the moon, and then Russia was like, "Well, we're done." And there's yeah. no real explanation as to why. They're just done. No, yeah. no, I mean completely done. I mean they never sent a guy to the moon. And we didn't go back. That was the other thing. It's like, why didn't we ever go back? Why are we talking about Orion when we haven't gone back to the moon? China, supposedly, has a moon probe, like a Mars rover, supposedly on the moon. It's been there for going on three years. And yet they don't take pictures of anything. And NASA has gotten ever since, honestly, I, I do feel bad for NASA in some sense because they didn't know. Once the Internet came out, NASA got so destroyed, you know, because everyone just analyzes and overanalyzes the pictures. And it's utter crap. But hmm. NASA has been trying to defend itself. You want to look up something fun, look up a third party confirmation of NASA landings or moon landings on Wiki. NASA started an entirely new Wiki section which basically the short version of it is don't take our word for it. Listen to these other space programs that can confirm we were there. Uh, it's like really the, the, the allies of you, the, the ones you gave the blueprints to, the ones that were in on it, you know, India, they went to the moon, what, you know, but they say they list all these people that can verify stuff and you're looking through it and they're like, they're not verifying anything. They, they, you know, you're just saying that they're verifying something. It's, it's, it's awful. I, yeah. So yeah, NASA was, the, the entire creation of it, again, not coincidentally, was actually after the third uh, atomic rocket test uh, against the dome, which was in 1958. So they did like three shots, all of which over a, a, a megaton, which was pretty pricey back in the 50s. And then right after that, you could, you could see their thought process. If you look hard enough, it's like, OK, well, apparently we can't break through it because if megatons aren't getting through it, you're not getting through it, at least not with with regular conventional weapons. And then it's like, okay, well, we got to, you know, become the gatekeepers. And NASA was formed right, you know, right after that. And it was, you know, again, these moves were, were big. But when you start connecting the dots, and I don't mind connecting dots and, and you know, when, when it's a stretch, but you have to do it. You've got to make a leap of faith. Uh, one, one more thing real quick, which was, uh, you know, because people say, well, you know, science would never lie to us. You know, science would never do this. I'm going, well, here's the thing. And and I'll use a movie reference because God knows I love movies. <laughs> Indiana Jones, The Raiders of the Lost Ark, 1981. Everyone knows the movie. You know, looking for the for the Ark. Everyone's fighting over the Ark. You know, the British are involved. The Americans, the Germans. It's in the Middle East. Who? It's all over the place. But who gets it in the end? You know, the last 60 seconds of that movie were very telling. The Americans got it. Indiana Jones was was shut out of taken out of the loop, and it's put into a, it's put into a crate put into a warehouse and you never see it again you know it's never shown to the public you know unless you want go to the what the fourth movie but it's never shown to the public ever again and you're just going what's the point my point is is the reason it was put in that crate is because the ark of the covenant went against science if some there's something out there that science doesn't have a theory for or it undermines science they are going to bury it literally if they can 
And that's what we're seeing here. Science was the one that found the edge of the world. They were the ones that said, oh, yeah, the Earth is a globe, the Earth is a globe, the Earth is a globe. And then they found out that it wasn't. Well, you say, well, then they should have told us. I'm going, yeah, it's a nice idea in theory. You know, transparency, there's a saying I came up with a couple of years ago, and that goes, transparency is great all the way up until the day that it isn't. And then you got to make a choice. And they chose. They said, look, we got to hold on to this sucker for as long as we can and figure out a way to spin it in our favor. And even then, it's starting to break down. The Internet has gotten too good at too many things. And, you know, again, you know, why, why, is, why did Flat Earth start taking off last year? Why has it gotten to the point now where we're, we're real close to just about everybody being exposed to it? And you know, we're just waiting for some mainstream thing to, to you know, hop on, somebody to champion it from, uh, you know, take, take that leap to break ranks. Uh, haven't done it yet, but, you know, I still have faith. Do you believe that the only reason, or, or pardon me there, <laughs> may have gotten it wrong. What? Uh, do you believe that the only reason, the sole reason for, you know, so it was, uh, was to push the, the globe model? But did I already ask that? Oh, yeah, yeah, NASA, yeah, yeah, the entire reason. Short version, yeah, yeah. the only reason NASA yeah, exists. I that. My apologies, I was no, no, going no, up on no. the wrong one. What no, about, I go fly brands, people lose their place. It's okay. Yep. What about the Mars program and the idea of going to Mars? Is that just to reinforce the globe model? Every It's not just Mars. Every story that you see released by NASA, and there's been more pretty much that the pace they've been releasing it now has been feverish. Um, if you see a story that's that's in the news about space, there is a subtext, <clears throat> and that is Pluto is not a planet anymore, and you're thinking about this from a globe. There is a hexagon on top of Saturn. You're on a globe. There's a face on Mars. You're on a globe. It doesn't matter if you believe or if you even pay that much attention to any of these things. We've got a probe that's leaving the solar system. We send it from this globe. Everything has a subtext that you're on a globe. That's all it's there for. Because as long as you even look at it, it reinforces the fact that there is space. You are in it, and you're on a globe. That's all, that's all they care about at this point. The Orion pro Project, the Mars program, will never, ever happen. It can't. There's, there's nothing they can do from a production standpoint to fake it. It's too tough to do. I mean, look how long they took to release uh, uh, full-disc pictures of the Earth. It, they waited 43 years, from 1972 until last year. And the only reason they did it last year is because we were begging for it. We were saying, look, there's no pictures of the Earth from space. So they released like 20 frames from a satellite we'd never even heard of that was exactly a million miles away and and the moon transiting in front of it. It was horrible. It was South Park could have made better animations than, than what they released. <laughs> and the um, the Himawari satellite, which is a geostationary satellite supposedly, shows the weather morphing but doesn't show the Earth spinning. So we can get one or the other, but we can't get both. They still won't explain it. Uh, it's it's staggering to me with the the lack of the lack of of things they produce. But the, the reason why they even produced it last year, and and the reason why I don't care. You know, it's like anyone says, oh yeah, look at this new picture. I'm going fine. When was it released? Oh, you know, end of an end of 2015. It's going. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You can't you can't release it after we ask for it, because then you you've already date stamped it. It's the angry wife syndrome. Which is um, <clears throat> some people have heard me do this one, which is um, the husband comes home, the wife's you know after 40 years and the wife goes I'm divorcing you, and he goes why? And she goes because in all the 40 years you've only given me one bouquet of flowers. So what happens the very next day? Husband shows up from work. He's carrying a bouquet of flowers. He goes look our marriage is saved. And she's going you only brought them because I told you about it yesterday. You know he's still in the doghouse. Same thing applies here. You can't show us pictures of the earth now. You know, have, you know, have, because now it's date stamped. Now it's like, okay, now you brought in a second picture. Why did it take you 43 years to release a second picture of the Earth from space? There's supposedly the Hubble telescope's been up there, what, better part of 20 years? Never turned around and taken a picture of the Earth? Come on. <laughs> you know, it, there's, there's, never, there's never been a video of anything un, un, unedited, you know, that shows anything leaving Earth's orbit or coming back. There's never been an astronaut that has taken a picture outside of, you know, a space thing. You know, it can be the moon. It's got to be 
outside, not this interior ISS BS. Outside that it, that is 180 degrees or better with the camera running. Um, we don't even have a a movie of an astronaut opening an airlock and leaving. It's amazing the lack of material that's out there. And uh, you know, again, you, I challenge anyone that's out there. Look, look it up for yourself. Find find some of the stuff. You won't be able to. We all tried, and I was hoping that somebody would find it eventually, which is why the whole flat Earth thing just keeps growing, because they realized that all the evidence that we thought, again, we assumed that NASA had wasn't there. I was one of them. So. All right, so then um, speaking of Mars, uh, would you say that all the Mars rover photos are fake? Oh, my God, yes. In fact, the, the Mars rover is um, is such a piece of junk that uh, I'll use this this one will make sense to to uh, all you grease monkeys out there and that is the Mars rover's battery is no different than a car battery yeah fine it uses a solar charger you know but it's you know battery technology is battery technology it, once it's not like there's two stages of batteries you know it, it, when you see the expiration on the side of a battery that means once that expiration is pretty much passed even if if it's rechargeable you won't be able to get a charge. So if anyone knows anything about cars, yeah, fine. You, you leave your lights on at night. You can jump the car in the morning, and you can have it, you know, AAA can come out, and they can charge your battery up. But after a certain number of years, and usually it's only six with car batteries, that battery dies. And by that, I mean you can put a jumper cable on it, hook it up to the frickin' uh, 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 generator from a dam, and that battery is never going to come back to life. It is dead, dead. Dead, 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 dead. <laughs> right? <laughs> and yet, the battery on the Mars rover should have died seven years ago. And it's still running. In fact, they had this period, apparently, where it was down for a while. And I think the American public had forgotten about it. And then they decided, you know what? Let's just turn this sucker back on and let it start roaming around. It's taking pictures now, supposedly. And, and they will not explain the battery problem. Uh, that's that's the first thing about the the Mars the Mars thing. The the second part about the Mars thing, which bugs me to no end, which is why the, why they're talking about it, I have no idea. Is the Mars is not the Moon. In, if you believe in you know in the solar system model, the Moon that's immensely easy by comparison to Mars. And you're thinking why? Well, the big thing with Mars is you see with the moon you know you're you're there's this null section of gravity the moon is part of earth if you believe in this which means you wouldn't you can get away with not that much thrust to 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 take off from the moon and come back right well yeah. how exactly are you getting back from mars because mars is a long way away and there's a huge chunk of null gravity in between us again if you believe in the solar system model so how exactly are you getting the fuel to get oh you know to get back and not only that you have to build an entirely new rocket on Mars. I mean yeah fine the the gravity is less but it's not the moon again if you believe in that. So when e Elon Musk comes on television and, and says oh yeah we're going to colonize Mars by blah 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 I, you couldn't be the it, there's no bigger lie there's no bigger public company hype that I've ever heard in my life. You live on a because globe. Oh no, uh, what? You live on a globe. You live on a globe. Yeah, that's that's basically it. He's he's talking. He knows full well they're not going to get it. They can't. And he's saying, "Oh yeah, we'll send robots there. We'll build the rocket from there." I'm going, "What? Do you know how much work it would take to build a you know rocket from <laughs> distance? With what are you going to build it? And then again, what are you going to? How are you going to make the fuel? You're going to like build a manufacturing plant and make fuel there? And what if what something goes wrong with the fuel? Uh, it just goes on and on. But, yeah, the Mars program is utter crap along with everything else, and it's only there to reinforce the globe. That's all it is. Going back to uh, um, this, and then I think uh, we only really have time to cover two more clues here. And, oh, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, um, but uh, you in your video on the um, status quo, you were saying that there's several reactions that the public – would have and I actually really like this list, which is the only reason why I even wrote it down because I, I thought it was all, I mean it's all humanity. Um, it's exactly what the human public would do, and that is uh, you said the public would react with wonder and awe. NASA yep. and all space programs are going to be disbanded. Observatories yep. are shut down because essentially they're staring at a giant ceiling. Yep. 
Major scientists would be discredited. The government would be called into question. And all religions temporarily will reunite against science. Yep. And uh, that sounds exactly like the human condition to me. <laughs> that sounds exactly like what we would do. Oh, um, yeah. But, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in putting myself in other people's shoes. And that's when I when I was looking at it, I was like, okay, how would I react? Or how would my neighbor react? And, and how would general science react? And, uh, and, you know, all the way into religion, it's like, oh, man. Yeah, and then I didn't blame them. Then I was like, "Oh yeah, of course. You know, they, that's they are going to keep the secret. They have to. You know, they're not going to risk it. If there's a there's one thing I learned, and I put that in the clue. If there's one thing I learned is that is, people in power don't take unnecessary risks. And if there's even a chance that people will, you know, march through the streets with pitchforks and torches, you do not do it. Uh, the public is dangerous when it comes to that. They do not react well in groups. You know, we, you know, anyone has any doubt of that? Look up the witch trials. I was gonna say that. <laughs> uh, is, is, she's a witch. Uh, you know, you get two people saying that in a group. That lady is done. She is cooked. If you float, then you're a witch. If you drown, sorry. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. And it, well, yeah. There weren't just a few of them. No. Nope. It killed, and it was. Yeah. It's, uh, anyway, go on. What, what else you got? Um. Okay. So. Um, death perception, I thought, and, and I'm actually, I chose these because I felt like this kind of um, best described uh, the message that you're trying to communicate along with all the facts. Um, yep. They were all, as I said, I encourage anybody to go to YouTube, go to Flat Earth Clues, they're all really good. Um, death perception, and I wanted to start out and ask you uh, before we talk about it, because uh, I don't think you actually addressed it, and I don't think you actually know, but I what? just want to ask it for the fun anyway, and that is how thick is the Flat Earth? do you think? <laughs> uh, I, it, it would have to be <sighs> minimum depth. I'd say a couple hundred miles. So not really that thin. No, not thick at all. Not thick at all. Cause a hundred, couple hundred miles, that's more than enough room to hold uh, a, a civilization. Get a member that we could be freaking inside a dome that is only a couple hundred miles high. Technically, if if we uh, if you know if we want to look at it realistically, because 95 percent of our population lives from sea level to one mile, which is only like 5000 feet at 7000 feet. A lot of people start developing altitude sickness. So if you want to hide and I'm, I only say a couple of miles because then you could put other civilizations down there and easily comfortably down there, luxury apartment type stuff down there you know where you could have air travel and you know, limited space travel and it wouldn't be no different than what we have here who's to say that the world we live in now isn't inside some giant underground cave or underwater for that you know for that matter we don't know because we only perceive the inside of the structure the building technically could be anywhere so okay so flat earth is a couple of uh as a couple hundred miles thick at least um, you've probably been asked this, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it anyway. And that is, um, so how, how do you explain then volcanoes, where their magma comes from, the whole underground volcanic activity in regards to a flat earth? How would that be applied to a flat earth? How would you be able to explain that? It's the only controversial part. It's the only part I actually caught some grief for. And even then. I didn't get a lot of grief because I still challenged people to, to come up with a better system, which is, look, if it's artificial, then the whole thing is artificial. People hate letting go of things they don't understand. So, for example, if you have a pet lizard, right, and you have a little terrarium for him, is anything, any part of that little world he lives in, is any part of that natural? No. no, it's all it's all artificial. The glass, the lid, the water thing, and the more elaborate you make it, you know, you know, the 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 lights involved, a little fan, who knows? Well, extrapolate that to something that's thousands of miles wide. Remember, what we think is really really huge might be really really small, depending, you know, to other civilizations. So the underwater conveyor system, which runs, you know, runs the uh, the ocean currents. What runs that? I mean, is that any, you know, any different than a than a giant bathtub jet? 
the <laughs> the uh, the jet stream which runs above. You know, that's hundreds of miles an hour air that's that's running above us and going in a in a in a particular pattern. Is that any different than like a car air conditioning system? When it comes to the magma system, yeah. It's a little trickier, but not that much. We can create, which is why I talked about it and think, look, we can create molten metal. We have blast furnaces. We can make this on a limited sense. But if you think for a second that the magma system is going to be left to chance, you are kidding yourself. Because from a design standpoint, you don't want to leave those sort of risks. Because if one super volcano gets out of hand, that's it. Your little experiment or your little, you know, plate of sea monkeys is toast hmm. so you control everything about it now does that mean I, i'm saying yeah the volcano systems is very is very very real and the magma system is very very real but i think it's controlled i think it's i think it is monitored and i think the magma system is controlled from down below how they're controlling it boy you got me i mean is there a pump system involved what, what did what did Lori frary make fun of me she called it it's like he's talking about lava pumps I was going, look, what else do you want to call them? I never said lava pumps. <laughs> but I was like, look, if you use something like a, the unified field, some sort of molecular magnetic system, you could run anything you wanted. And you could do it fairly safely, even with all that heat. Uh, but, yeah, you, it still have to be controlled. You're not going to leave a magma system uh, to natural causes. You just can't. Now, does that mean you, you, it'll stop people from living next to volcanoes? No. People still do dumb things. Vesuvius, they got what they deserved. <laughs> Mount, Mount, Mount St. <laughs> Helens, well, you know, that was fairly minimal by comparison. Krakatoa, that was not in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so all the big volcanoes, you know, people generally don't park, you know, giant cities. I think there's a couple in Japan, which are pretty close, but we don't like talking about it. Um, but I do think it's artificial, and I, I do think that uh, that it's, it's that it is monitored, and it is no different from the underwater conveyor system, the jet stream system, and every other system that's in. The only difference is that it's magma. That's that's it. You know, and they, if you can build, if you can build a structure that's thousands of miles wide, and you know, we'll just round up, say a thousand miles high, then what can't what can't you do? Got to remember, whoever built this apparently doesn't think that size is a big deal. So heat's probably not a big deal. Wind is not a big deal. Oceans are not a big deal. It's it's very manageable. Hmm. I, I like that perspective. Um, and the thing that uh, that you had stated that I got out of the video was, um, of course, people are going to dig. You can't go up. You've got the yeah. – they can't break through it with a one-ton, megaton nuclear bomb. Yeah. Um, and so what's the next inclination is, of course, dig. they're going to want to dig. Yeah. And then and what's uh, the deepest hole ever drilled? Eight miles. Eight miles. And then you, but the point that you go on to make, though, is, of course, one of the reasons for the whole volcano and magma flow and all that stuff is the way you keep people from digging is make it hotter the deeper it goes. Yeah. And it works very well, very, very well. The negative reinforcement in this place is subtle. And that is at eight miles, apparently, your drill bit turns to clay and that's it. You can't drill anymore. Uh, the the Russians tried, the Germans tried, uh, you know the deep bore systems, and that eight miles down that is not very far. And the Russians tried to go further than eight miles. They got stuck at eight miles, and they tried for something like ten, twelve years, trying to go past it. They couldn't do it. So, it, and and that's perfect. That's what you would expect because there's going to be a, a hard ceiling or a hard floor. Where you're not going to be able to go past. And even if you could, eventually, yeah, you know, you're going to run into some sort of simulated magma, you know, or some sort of thing, magma area to where, you know, no matter what you use, we don't have an element, as far as I know, that can defy magma. So, you know, because we don't have the, uh, the unified field mastered yet, which I don't think we're going to at any time soon. And there you go. It's, it's easy. So it's a great, again, a great little reinforcement tool that helps you. And keeps everything in balance, and for the most part, nobody's going to question it. It's like, well, magma. Well, you know, because volcanoes, we see magma. You know, we, we see it coming up through there. So it's obvious that we can only go down so far. It's like, yeah, but eight miles still is not that far. I was I was actually hoping it would be further. 20 miles, I think, would be a little better. Right. Know? Maybe in the next version. We'll see. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and for the, for the last one here, and I think people need to hear this because I, I thought it was actually – 
very educated. Let's talk about the long haul. Go ahead and talk to us about the long haul for a couple minutes here as our last flat earth clue. Sure, sure, sure. The long haul is about the flights, which was, uh, and that wasn't, that wasn't initially given to me. That was the long haul idea was an idea that was thrown to me by a guy in England named Lawrence Wright. And he, in fact, the long haul was his title. You know, he, he came up with some interesting, cause long haul is considered long flight planes. Uh, ones that, that really travel some really great distances. And what he was saying and what I confirmed was that when you're in the Southern Hemisphere, even in the Northern Hemisphere, you know, planes will drop off of, of GPS. But in the Southern Hemisphere, they take weird routes. That's the big difference between the Northern and the Southern. And that is when you're flying in the Southern Hemisphere, anywhere in the South, as long as it's below the equator, quite a bit below the equator. If you're taking flights from any of those major cities down there, they don't go where you think they should go they fly to the weirdest destinations and by that i mean when you draw them on a globe they take these weird arcing high arcing uh connection flights which double their flight time you think why would they do that and and most of them i mean most of them are double and triple connections and i've flown triple connections before when i was doing business travel and they were paying the ass and that's why everyone complains about them but when you take those routes and you overlay them onto an AE map, a flat map, they turn into straight lines or shallow dog legs. They become perfectly natural, meaning, and the only way that could make sense is if the flat map was the more accurate map. And that's the part they can't hide, which is why when I was doing the long haul, it's the one of the rules you can't break when you're trying to hide the world, there's one of the one of the rules you can't break is there's no shortcuts on a flat map. There are shortcuts on a globe or an apple or an orange. You can you can go different directions and get to the same place because it goes around as a sphere. But if you're on a flat map, you have to go one direction. You know, yeah, yeah you find you can bounce off certain things if you really really wanted to, but you can only really go one direction. You can't go the opposite direction and come back around. And <clears throat> By that I mean, if you want to look at some really funky stuff, look on a flat map where Australia is and South America is. They're completely opposite ends of the map. And so that's why when you're looking at flights, the flights bounce off of weird locations is because they're trying to – because on a flat map, they're going through the straight line. And so what we're saying is is that flights that usually go over the ocean are actually hugging the coast, and even the pilots don't know. Because the GPS system was designed by who? The United States Government Department of the Defense in the 1990s. So the GPS system is telling you what it wants you to see. So, and the pilots don't know any different. It's a great system. It's fairly ingenious. Where the even the pilots don't know because, as several pilots have told me, as long as you take off from point A and land at point B and nobody dies, hey, that's a good day. So let's not mess with anything. So all the pilots are super busy. They don't know. The navigators don't know. And even if you did know, even if you could figure it out, would you make that leap of faith? And if you did make that leap of faith, there's so many layers to this. If you did make that leap of faith, who are you going to tell? Are you going to tell the captain of the airplane? Are you going to tell the airline? Are you going to tell the FAA? Are you going to tell your wife? Who are you going <laughs> to tell exactly? Because right. we've seen what happens when pilots even say the word UFO. You know, if a pilot, you know, there's that line from Close Encounters, which was so great, where they had these, this UFO buzz between these two planes. And, you know, the, the tower saying, you want to report a UFO? And they're going, no. <laughs> because, <laughs> cause, you know, I mean, the, the, the guy, the, the perfect example was that 1986 Japanese pilot that was flying a cargo 747. He was going across Alaska, and this giant walnut-shaped UFO that was apparently twice the size of an aircraft carrier followed him for hundreds of miles. He could not shake him. And the Air Force base was was trying to guide him through because they didn't know what it was. And he gets on the ground. What do you think he did? He told people about it. What do you think happened the very next week? He was benched. He had a desk job, and he never flew again. And he was a veteran pilot, too, 20-something years. And that was just saying UFO. You say flat earth? And I, I can't tell the future, but I can foresee a psychological profile in whoever talks about that because, you know, it's it's the most – is the craziest thing out there. And, again, it's crazy. It is the most advanced crazy thing because it's the only thing we debunked – we're told – that is debunked to us as children. That's it. 
It's it, no other thing are we told uh, are, are we conditioned to as much as this, as this, which is why it would let me know it's the greatest secret ever, because it you know if you start off that young it's, seriously it's, it's, try to find anything else. This is the first thing you are shown a globe first thing before you are learned to read and write and play with shapes and you know any of this stuff you that globe is there with you the entire time. It is brilliant. The, the reinforcement tool is fantastic, which is why, again, some of your listeners right now are probably thinking this guy is certifiable. He is insane. I, I will say this, and I know you've got to wrap this up pretty quick, which is nobody well, – you guys may be the exception – Nobody, though, that I know started out as a flat earther. David Wise from Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole quoted it best, and that is, we all became flat earthers because we tried to debunk flat earth. You go down it and you say, it's ridiculous. I'm going to prove it's wrong. And that's what I hope anyone that's listening to this does. Try to prove it's wrong because you're going to get sucked in. And I'm sorry. I'm so sorry <laughs> because you'll lose sleep. You won't sleep for weeks. Some of you, you're just going to be sitting there in your computer. You're going to be going through video after video, trying to find the holes and you won't find them, uh, which is why, again, we've got a 99.9% retention rate. Hmm. And uh, it's, you know, it's, that's why it's so fun. It's why I'm never going to, I'm going to do this till the, till the bitter end. Uh, yeah. And you actually point out and you kind of hint to that in your comments. And that is for if plane pilots or, you know, astronauts, or if there are astronauts um, mm -hmm. or anything like that, if they try to, you know, in a sense, kind of renounce their globe idea, they're basically renouncing everything that they've been taught in school, in college, as a child, everything yeah. it takes to qualify to be a pilot or an astronaut. Yeah. I mean, you're renouncing everything you know. Yeah. And uh, that, uh, and I think I was listening to you on Mysterious Radio, I think was the podcast that you did. And uh, <clears throat> you had said that one of the girls there on that show had asked you, uh, if they could fly to the edge and uh, uh, in a roundabout way, basically you say, well, you can try, but all of our navigation, all of our technology is based on this premise of GPS. And either you're going to be rerouted um, back to your starting point, or if you try to fly blindly without the GPS, um, you're going to end up somewhere you wish you hadn't, you know, gotten to oh, yeah. because yeah. of the fact that there's no way to be able to navigate to the edge of the world, so to speak. No. Um, without equipment no. and without some sort of visible line of sight to the edge. Yeah, yeah. And again, remember, the, the world's greatest explorer was looking for this damn thing for 26 years. And he still, you know, it took him that long to find it. So, you know, unless you know Antarctica well and you can fly, unless you're a really good pilot and fly without ground markers, because, you know, Antarctica is not great for land markers. Uh, you know, you're going to get snow blind even at that altitude. Um, you're not going to you're not going to find it. It is well hidden. It is well protected. And it's uh, again, it's very, very clever how it's been hidden for the last 60 years. But that's where we are. You know, does it does it change? You know, does it change you as a person? Does it change, you know, your job tomorrow? No, probably not. But it will change your way of thinking eventually. So um, there you go. wrapping up comments here um, and I uh, sometime in the future. Thank you once again for coming on uh, this show. Oh, yeah. Um, this is our third, you know, official episode. And so it's really, really kind of you to come on. Um, so hopefully sometime oh, in the future, happy to do it. <laughs> um, we can have you on again with some sort of updates and what's going on in the world of the flat earth. Oh, um, yeah. In the meantime, I just wanted to ask you real quick, because these are a couple questions that came to mind myself and. Um, what is your uh, mission in a quick uh, nutshell with the whole flat earth clues and espousing the flat earth idea and talking to people about it? What's your mission there? To rule the world. No, that's not it. The, um, Didn't Madonna my mission say that? is to, no, I think actually p the pinky in the brain. Oh I yeah, that's that was, right. That was... <laughs> <laughs> so rule the <laughs> world. Familiar. Yeah, the uh, no, no, no. It is it is to create the hundredth monkey effect. That's the big one, and that is, look, the the truth should be free. It shouldn't. Uh, it should be available to everybody. And I think that if enough people figure this out, we will snap into potentially a whole new paradigm of thinking. I'm not talking about a kumbaya flower child moment. I'm talking about an accountability thing where we realize it's like because if there is a creator then we are all accountable for our actions, which means uh, all the obvious things, which we haven't been really doing well with 
for the last oh, I don't know several centuries, we would we, there would be no witch burnings ever ever again. Racism, sexism, hate crimes, uh, wars. How, how many of these things would you do? You know, deliberately. Would you, in fact, would you do anything maliciously to anyone to ever, ever anyone ever again? And I, th- you know, I, again, it's a glass half full type scenario, but I think it's very very possible. I think it is a way for us to veer away from the abyss that we've been heading for at top speed, and I'm going to give everything I got to to make sure that happens. Uh, so you know, again, I'll I'll talk to anybody. I will debate anybody, and you know, I'm just going to keep making videos until you know it happens or I die. One of the two. All right, um, Chuck. Anything you want to say? Anything you want to add? Actually, I think I've. Yeah, I mean, just been content to listen to most of this. I mean, I've got nothing else, so thank you. Um, go ahead. For our blabbermouth, and seriously, it was a big yeah. distraction having you on the show. Well, thank you very much. I know, he just right. wouldn't shut yeah. up. I know. God, yeah, yep, yep, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway. Go ahead and uh, promo your promo your stuff, man. Your right. website and all that. Your book that uh, just came out recently, I believe. Uh, yeah, okay, real quick. Um, the subscription site is marksargent.com. The free site is enclosedworld.com. Flat Earth Clues, you can type that into any search engine. Uh, you will find the YouTube site. You will find all the mirrors. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter if it's on my channel. My channel is Mark K. Sargent, but you can just type Flat Earth Clues into anywhere. The book is called Flat Earth Clues. The audio book is called Flat Earth Clues. <laughs> and uh, I am on True Frequency Radio every Tuesday night right now doing a show called Strange World. And... I also do a show with Patricia Steer from Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes. Uh, we're back doing that again on Wednesdays. So, yeah, a lot of stuff. And that's just what we've done in the first 18, 19 months. So, in fact, I just finished Strange World episode. This one's going to be episode 80. And uh, Patricia's just finishing up, like, episode 130. And I've been interviewed, I don't know, 92, 93 times, something like that. 94 so. now. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think this is ninety three with you. Okay. So well, it's my pleasure. But, I, but I, there's some some haven't been published. So anyway. Well, this will be published. We'll also make sure that we get um, links to all your sites on our website um, as well, and uh, make sure that um, we have it in the description here on the podcast as well, so people will know how to get a hold of you. Cool. Um, now, when you're going to try to stitch this together, uh, well, I mean, well, you know, I suppose you might as well say goodbye first. Do you have to do a sign off? Uh. Um, yeah, I guess we will do that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, uh, thank you for co- listening to Devil's Been Talking Radio. This is Mark Sargent with Flat Earth Clues, uh, along with everything else that uh, he had mentioned about his book and the websites and all that. And we will be back next Sunday doing a quick cast for all you guys who just need a short podcast to listen to while you're going on a jog or going to the gym or driving to work. So, everybody, you have a good one, and we'll be back on again.